Howdy, 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 and happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, not really doing anything. Not really doing anything, anything particularly on theme or or Halloweeny on the stream tonight. Um, kind of, kind of did all my usual Halloween traditions uh, with the wife elsewhere. We usually, we usually have a couple of a couple of particular movies we watch, and then I, I live very rural right now, and so we don't really get any trick-or-treaters, like, ever. Uh, we carved up a couple of pumpkins. I did a little, little, little Thunderhead pumpkin. I'll, I'll get some, some, some jack-o'-lanterns. A thunder lantern, if you will. I'll get some pictures of that posted over to the Discord a little bit later. I hope you folks out there are having a good Halloween night. I hope that, uh, all the spirits are being properly warded. I hope that what brave trick-or-treaters out there are getting their share of the candy. White Wolf, thank you so, so much for 19 months. Holy shit. Thank you. Thank you so much for that resub. White Wolf, year and seven months. Let's build some plastic things. I agree. I agree. Let's build some plastic things. Last few days. Man, ooh. Yeah. Sorry I missed that Thursday stream, folks. Um... Every now and then, every now and then, life just rears its head and, and, and punches you in the face a little bit. And I had one of those earlier this week. Um, a lot of people have expressed their their concern and well wishes over it. I'd like to assure everyone that while it was very unpleasant in the moment, things have stabilized in a fairly positive way at this point. So it was it was a bit of a shock, and it definitely threw off my momentum for the week. But we're getting it back. We are getting it back. Avash, I am going to be building, um, I'm going to be working on basing some 3D printed proxies for 100 Kingdoms Sakari. Sakari? Sakari? Uh, what, what, what was the origin of that word? Sakari. I, I, I don't know it. Um, and then I'm going to be building my last unit of 100 Kingdoms Militia Bowmen. Really exciting, I know. A bunch of peasants with bows. It might be a little exciting because I am stringing the bows. And I have 3D printed myself a series of uh, broadhead arrows. Uh, I've done one unit successfully this way so far, and I should be able to get through most of a unit tonight. The only ones I'm not going to be able to do live on stream are the ones where I heat and bend the bow limbs a little bit to get more of a drawn posture. But I can certainly show you how I do the rest of it. But yeah, I'll tell you the good news, though. The good news is it's looking like, uh, for a bit, it was looking like I might not get any games of Conquest in the coming month over Thanksgiving, it's looking more like that is going to happen now. And so I'm like hard charging to get this force finished building. I, I doubt I'm going to have it painted by then, but I'm going to have 1,200 points of 100 kingdoms built, based, primed, in the process of painting. The process is important. <sighs> Finishing projects is absolutely, absolutely my, my, my weakest thing this year. Hasn't been as bad in previous years, but this year I'm just like, I start a million projects, and we finished five. <laughs> That's the one, Mr. Square Peg. Conquest. The Last Argument of Kings, one of the longest titles for a tabletop war game. I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. That you may ever have heard. Um, and yeah, if you guys want more info on that, you can always hit exclamation point conquest to get a link over to Parabellum's site. A lot of good info on there. A lot of good lore. Um, they got maps of the world. They got details on the factions. I'm, I, I, I know I've mentioned it before, but I'm fairly impressed with how Parabellum has put this game together. The double I is pronounced A. So Sicare, Sicari, Sicari, Sicarino, Sicelius. I don't know. I don't know. The point is, the models for that don't exist yet, but I found some online that I like the look of, and I have gone ahead and 3D printed those, and I'll be showing those to you. Uh oh! Ow! Oh god! Oh that hurt! Oh that hurt! That was that was a silly thing. That was a silly thing to have done. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, bear with me for one second. I'm going to pop you over to the BRB screen, and I'll be just a minute. I need to get up and grab something real quick. And it'll just take a moment. It'll just take a moment. So stay right there.
Well, that white wolf would be big because it just finished burting, as it were. Um, I'm printing another one of them. I'll show you what it just got done printing, and it's going to be printing something kind of boring today. I do apologize for that. Pretty flat, done in a couple of hours, but I might as well show. Uh, so I, I, I've mentioned before I went to all the effort of making my cool little magnetic puzzle piece connectors for my conquest trays. And I like them, and they're good, particularly for building oddly shaped units. But I am also loving this new thing that I did. These regiment trays are the shit. I absolutely love these. They work with the standard uh, unit stands that come with Conquest. And then they they also... I have I've put in little cut-ins in my 3D printed bases so that you can just drop those right into place. Real nice and easy. Since the last time I have built, this is an all new unit of Household Knights for the Hundred Kingdoms. Uh, I'm going to be getting started painting these guys later this week is my goal. But I got them finished building and based. Um, as of last night, really, I was up, I was up doing this. I got them with their new proxied helmets on. I have a banner. Speaking of which, the banner on the, look at the fucking size of this thing. This model is the, the the specifically the banner model for the household knights is just nonsense. I need more of them. Yeah, I know, Avash. I like. I'm just I'm just gonna eat some crow here. This tray is better than the puzzle piece connectors. This is a better system, and I feel like a fucking asshole for taking this long to realize it. It uh yeah. I put so much effort into the first way, and then the second way was so much easier to do. And it's better Zombie Brush Studios. Oh yeah, hey Zombie Brush, I'm sorry. I, I, I saw you there, I didn't say hi. It's good to see you, man. How's things? How will you magnetize them when they're in the trays? Well, I mean, they're still magnetic. They magnetize down just fine. And then if you don't want to use the tray for whatever reason, you still have the little puzzle piece magnetic connectors. So you can use both. I figured there's no reason not to have both be possible. Uh, but really the nice thing about these trays, and here's here's another one of the four wide. The, like, the downfall of this is that you can't have oddly shaped units, or if you want to make like a single line, it can be a little complicated to do. Um, if you just need to remove one tray from a square, you're going to have this big goofy section sticking off the back. So I think there's a place for both. And that's why I'm leaving the trays capable of... And I keep using stand and tray interchangeably, and I, I fix my nomenclature. But uh, I, think, I, think, I think both are useful. You know, why not, why not do it all? And I've got a number of different versions of those movement trays available, including I think the largest is, is a 9 block. It's a 3x3. Three three. But this works stupidly well, and you're able to pick up... <clears throat> excuse me, pick up and move the unit, transport it between tables, like, this is fucking amazing. Avash, these, uh, the files for these trays uh, are included in the files for my bases. Um, I'm going to have him list these trays as well as standard 3D printable magnet-friendly blank bases that are friendly for FDM. Those are going to be listed for free. Um, as of now, if you get uh, this set, the, the Old Market Road set of 3D printable bases, you will also get the FDM files for all of these movement trays. You want to talk Dune? You want to talk Dune, Roland? <clears throat> so Squared. Is Squared in chat right now? I haven't seen him. Um, linked me earlier. It, it's just, it's the Fadaiken fight scene from Dune, the flash forward when the Fadaiken are fighting the Sardaukar. But, but but set to the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers theme. <laughs> and, like, I was mostly kidding when I said that, but it actually kind of works shockingly well. How are the bases printing-wise? Avash, I've got this down pretty damn well. I've been running these off on my, my Mars. And I think I've sorted... I, I mentioned before, these, these trays... Excuse me. Wait, which ones are you asking about, Avash? Are you asking about the textured resin ones or the, 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 the movement trays? I should say, these are stands. These are not trays. This is a stand, this is a base, and this over here is a tray. I thought it was very Hans Zimmer-esque, Roland. I just thought that it, it fit the universe a little bit better. Um, 
So there is a trick to these. There's a little bit of a trick to these, and that is that you can wind up with, and this is this in no way impacts their function, but I'll show it to you. I think you can see it here, because the one on the right is very flat, and the one on the left has a little bit of a bow to it. You can kind of see that little separation between them. So a lot of these will want to bow a little bit as they cure, and I've more or less sorted this by when I'm... It depends on how you cure your resin and what kind of resin. I use water washable, so it can be a little bit more flexy, and I use a... Elegoo... Saturn... Well, not Saturn. Elegoo... What are their curing stations called? Mercury? Is it Mercury? Maybe it's called Mercury. Because because the one, the wash and cure station is the Mercury 2, I want to say. And I've got the Mercury 1, which is just a turntable with some UV lights. But my trick has been basically to cure this for one minute at a time. First bottom up, then top up, bottom up, top up for four minutes in total. And that gets this cured really, really nicely and, and really, really flat. Now, I will say that the worst curling problems I have had with these trays doesn't actually yield a mechanical issue of any sort. It just won't be as precisely perfect as you might want. Um, I'm interested to find out what other people's experiences are with that, because I think it might just be the water washable resin tends toward that a little bit more when you have thinner pieces. But the point being, if you cure these pieces carefully, if you're aware of that, you cure them carefully, you cure them evenly, you don't have the problem. Um, but I am making people aware of that, because if you're going to buy the files, you want to make sure that you go ahead and process them correctly. I will say that my pre-supports have all worked out pretty nice. As far as getting good sharp edges and flat bottoms, I've had a lot of practice at doing this. My pre-supports are um, not terribly significant. They're only attached in the places they really need to be. I've had good success with all of them so far, and I'm usually able to just swipe the supports off with my thumb and leave, like, because there's a bunch of supports on the bottom, but you can't really see any connection points. What resin do I use, and how is the smell? I use Elegoo Water Washable Ceramic Gray. Um, not bad. Like, really, uh, uh, I, I have two 3D printers in my office. They're maybe, like, six feet behind my head right now. And once the cover's on, it's really, it's really not an issue. As long as the room is well ventilated, which my office is. Like, I, I wouldn't lock yourself in a box with a bunch of ultraviolet sensitive resin. I wouldn't huff it right out of the bottle. But, uh, yeah, yes. So, Avash, um, he usually takes him a little bit after he gets the files up, but I believe he is planning to offer printed versions of this. So, so keep an eye out for that, and he'll get some some sets put up, and you should just be able to buy a whole a whole bunch a whole bunch of your your groovy little trays. You can see this is the old version; it doesn't have the little corners out. I'm I'm the only poor son of a bitch who's gonna have any of those. All the new ones go in these handy dandy little trays. Speaking of trays, here's another unit on the movement tray, all connected up, all nice. And again, I, I will reiterate: this works with. Like, the standard, like, if you don't want to use these, the standard Parabellum unit stands will click into this and will fit perfectly. That's what I sized it to. Uh, so these are my Sakari. These are from a guy on my mini factory, I believe, called the Comet Lord. These are called the Comet Lord's Chosen. They're a bunch of, like, crazy monk cultists with goofy little arm blades, and I thought, yeah. Yeah, that, that'll work. So the rules for these guys in Conquest are a little interesting. Mr. Square Peg, I do water washable because um, it's, it, what, what it means is it's water soluble. The resin is, is soluble in water, which is why you can wash it that way. Um, and the reason that I like it is regular resins are more soluble in uh, like isopropyl alcohol. And you need high percentage isopro. You need like 91% isopropyl to really be effective. And here's the thing, 91% isopropyl alcohol, if you're not storing it and buying it anyway, it's caustic and potentially explosive in some of the settings that we like to use it in. So I, I, I try not to handle any more chemicals than I absolutely have to. The water washable is a little bit more expensive, but I think it... it it equals out when you factor in the fact that you have to buy other chemicals to process it. Expected them to have a mace or a great sword. So when I looked up the word Sakari, when I when I engaged 
my Google faculties, and I did, obviously, years and years of research condensed down into about five minutes of browsing the first three results on Google. Um, they were historically a bunch of assassins and used nasty little curved knives. So I was like, okay, lightly armored, first of all. Well, and that's the thing, too. Talking about their game stats. They're lightly armored. They don't do a lot of damage. What they have is an ability where every time one of them dies, they kill an enemy that is in contact with them. And then there's a special rule you can give them by using your Theist Priest, which is the reason I want to use Sicarius, because I just painted that Theist Priest, that will give them the Death Cult rule, where every turn they inflict as many wounds on any enemies that they're in contact with as, as stands are in contact. They're just, they're just crazy death cultists. And I kind of want to paint these guys up with, like, nasty robes. You know, like, like white robes that are just kind of, like, dirty and maybe have, like, blood and dirt. Or, like, blood around the hands and dirt around the feet. Like, there's a bunch of the crazed uh, murder cultists. You know, why not? No, Mr. Square Peg, you can always ask. I don't promise I'm going to answer every question, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer those that I get to. Yeah, no IPA in the paint shaker. Yeah, people, if you're processing 3D prints, don't put isopropyl alcohol in a, uh... This is something people have done. Don't put isopropyl alcohol in an ultrasonic cleaner. Because, you know, you know what the, you know what you call it? When you take an explosive... Like... <laughs> you, when, you, when you take something like IPA that is that flammable, and you combine it with oxygen into a nice fuel-air mixture, and then you confine it in a tight space? It's called a bomb. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't put IPA in ultrasonic cleaners. It probably won't explode, but if it does, you're gonna be sorry. And that shit burns. It burns like crazy. Ah, all they do is just hold something down to prevent them from moving. Held down a six-stand of Huskarls with a five-stand regiment of Sakar. Yeah, that was this was my thinking. And I'm glad to hear that, Avash, since you've actually used them. I haven't used them yet. My theory was, because I've got two more trays of these guys, and then I'm attaching in my, my Theist Priest as their, their leader to give them the Death Cult rule. But the idea is that these guys are a tar pit, effectively. The 1,200-point list that I'm, that I'm going to be running consists of one... Minimum size unit of militia who I've got back here and they are they exist because with the way the game plays Units that are light can come onto the board in the first round units that are medium can come on in the second So I'm like, okay, I need some light infantry to get out there and start taking objectives early So I've got one group of regular militia two groups of militia bowmen and the idea being that the militia can move forward and start contesting objectives and maybe block something up if they've got some other light units moving in. The bowmen can provide fire support, ideally for the duration of the game. And then on the second round, I can start bringing in the Sakari and two units of, uh... Well, it's, it's either going to be two units of four of these household knights, which, God, I love these models... Or it's going to be one unit of six with the Mounted Noble Lord. One of the two. I'm going to try the list both ways. But either way, it comes out to about 1,200 points. Oh, I put this... You see, I just put him on here on here wrong, and now it doesn't look right. This tray is meant to go like this. And then, see? You see? You see what I've done? You have, like, a nice central road and dirt on either side. Yes, contest, Avash. The point is to have forward presence on the board from the first round and not have to wait around for round two to get literally anyone out there. The The militia essentially are just cheap as hell and exist to uh, herald the arrival of much, much scarier units. Not that much scarier. Sakari and Household Knights. I'm looking forward to testing it out, either way. It's it's a little bit of a fluffy list. I tried to run a lot of Militia because I'm running the Theist Priest. It's They can take Militia, and then they can take Sakari. That's, those are their only options. I don't know, Roland. I'm not quite getting that from this song. See, so I'm going to be building some more of these guys today. These are my Militia Bowmen. 
And uh, I'm not putting helmets on these guys. They, they have little details on their head that kind of resemble hair. And I'm going to try to paint it like hair. They're not the greatest models in the history of mankind. But they're also, again, among the very, very first models that Parabellum released. So I, I'm, I am understanding on that front. Uh, they're, they're decent to build. We're going to build some more of these guys tonight. And uh, you can see I've strung the bows and I've added little arrows. And I like to do this with all of my my archery units for war games. It's something I've done with uh, Lord of the Rings. I did it with Rune Wars. I've done it with a number of them. Since I started 3D printing, I've discovered that 3D printing primer strings, that's what these, this is. This is waste material from 3D printing over there on my... Uh, it can't be Neptune, because that's the Elegu Neptune 2 right there. Mercury. Yeah, no, we already decided that. Okay, I had a brain fart. Over there on the Neptune, this is this is waste product. And then I 3D printed these little these little arrows to go with as well. I'll be attaching some of those today. They're kind of limited in their posability, but I managed to get some decent variety out of them. I just like the look of bowstrings, you know? Yeah, the Neptune 2S, Mr. Square Peg, as I understand it, is basically the Neptune, but it has a dual extruder, so you can load in two different filaments of different colors or different consistencies. You can use, like, a flexible filament in one, and um, you can you can print things that have different, different colors or if you need different materials. I've seen people print shocks by using... Uh, like a flexible print material inside of a solid shell that prints around it. Also, here are two other proxies that I'm going to be using as, um, as what's its neophytes. So I have this vague theory in this list that I'm going to have neophytes in with my Militia Bowman, so that on the turn when my Theist Priest pops his Supremacy ability, he can bless everybody who has a neophyte in the unit, and... The Militia Bowmen kind of suck, so I do want at least one round that I can pop off a Blessing on them to get them a reroll and hopefully capitalize on their Mast Fire. We will see how that goes. These guys were fun. Uh, these files are not exactly as they were. I bought these guys for, I think, $3 from... What did I say his name was? What a time for the music to just stop. Thank you, music. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for drawing attention to the fact that I forgot the name of the person I was just trying to say. Um, I literally just said it. The something lord. I keep wanting to say the squid lord, but that's not right. Uh, I'll, I'll post it up on the Discord. Either way, um, there were parts of one model I liked and parts of another that I did, so I went into ZBrush and I just used this as practice. I cut the mesh for the top of this body out. And I went ahead and uh, stitched it into another body and then swapped out their weapons for staves. And now I've got these little neophyte guys. Squid Lord game? Uh, yeah, sure. That's You know what? That's entirely possible. Why not? And then as our final proxy, we have our Vernon Roach print, who is going to be my Hundred Kingdoms Imperial Officer for, for an upcoming and, and different list that I'm making. Standing on top of a, a broken stone, looks like granite road sign there. I really like this model. I'm, I'm looking forward to printing this one. Oh, thank you for saying so, Mr. Square Peg. It's been dual gear extruder, not dual extruder. Are, are you sure? I would have thought that the... Oh, that's the 2D. Ah. Okay. Wait, dual gear extruder... What does that get you functionally? What is adding... I'm trying to think, like, what... What What does that do? I'm trying to think where I would add another gear to the extruder assembly. Is it direct drive? Because, I mean, that would be cool. I wouldn't mind getting myself a direct drive Neptune. I'm getting them all assembled and on their bases so that I can play with them, and then working through them paint job-wise. I have started on my militia. Where's the guy? I have started on my militia. I've gotten a few test models pretty far along, so you can get an idea for how they're going to look. His, his face and a few details haven't been done on him yet, his hands and such, but 
I got down my formula for doing wood and leather on my initial militia testers. Alright, let me see, let me see here. Halloween costume frightened everyone. Oh god, Roland, what have you done? What have you done? Pushes on both sides rather than one on... Oh, so it doesn't have the little... Well, I, I'd imagine it still has a little tension arm to pull them together. But instead of one bearing, it's, is it two stepper motors? I don't know, that never struck me as a feature that I really wanted. Does it deliver genuinely increased performance? I haven't read about this at all. I'm kind of interested. I haven't seen any printers that have done that. Did you put it in the uh, the Conquest channel, Avash? I'll take a look at it. And by the way, Avash, I absolutely appreciate your commentary on any of the list building that I do. Um, I, I'm certainly not building to any sort of meta, and I'm certainly not building to be competitive, but that doesn't mean that I want to do anything particularly stupid. So, uh, yeah, if you have any comments, please let me know. Oh, no, I just knocked over my household nights. That was terrible. I wanted to share my updated noble uh, mounted lord because I changed a few pieces on him and made him a little bit fancier. A little bit fancier. He's got a fancier shield now and he's wearing a cape because hes I figure he's a noble lord. He should at least wear a cape. You know? He's not a superhero. He's, he's allowed to. And a happy Halloween to you as well, Romeo Void. Is it really? How is it that I've literally never hear, never heard of adding a dual gear to Square? Like, I've been printing for several years now, and I think this is the first time I've ever heard of anyone adding an extra gear to the extruder. It is entirely possible, in fact, likely, that I just haven't been paying any attention to, or maybe I saw that and just misinterpreted it in my head and never really thought much more about it. But I, I have not seen that. I'm kind of interested in how I missed it for all this time. I think he came out nice, though. I'm really, really happy with the 3D printed uh, helmet upgrade on him with the little torus and mantle hanging off the back. I think this is gonna look good. Okay, I have, uh, now, okay. I have seen, <sighs> I've seen dual gear direct drive, but just a, a regular Bowden tube extruder with an extra gear on it. Somehow I've missed this entirely. That's that's shocking. Oh, well that probably explains it, White Wolf. I don't give a fuck about high-end printers. That's <laughs> I, I don't even look at, at Prusas or anything like that. I, I stick to the low-end DIY. I, I don't even glance at them. So maybe if I'd looked closer, I would have seen it. Well, it goes to show, you can you can just kind of not fucking pay attention to things. Who knew? Who knew? All right, let me get this stuff out of the way here and break out my malicious sprues so we can get the building. Start with a fresh box tonight. We want to build, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit more than I usually do. Yeah, Holy Fire definitely seems interesting, particularly um, for when you're trying to, to get to grips but not quite in charging range yet. I'm going to try out as many different options with the Theist Priest as I can since I spent so much time painting one. Updated my Prusa Mini with a Bontech Dual Gear. Just got a Neptune recently. Any pitfalls to watch out for? Uh, DFW Dwegham, I really haven't noticed any. I've been running my Neptune 2 for a, a, a number of months now with just stock parts. I really haven't... I, I have one time had a little bit of a clog in the nozzle, and all I did was I just did my standard maintenance check where I swap out the nozzle and I replace the Bowden tube with some Capricorn, but that's been it. More and more, I'm a fan of just running them pretty stock. The Neptune does does pretty well right out of the box. Here we have these these bases that I'm going to throw away. But since I got them, 
Hey, Hanotic Mom, and a very happy Halloween to you as well. You're gonna go trick or treating? Well, have fun. Don't don't let your sweet tooth, you know, get too out of control. Hope you guys have a good time. Just figured I'd show you since I can. These are the standard trays that come with. Uh... Oop, there we go. These are the standard trays that come with all the units from Conquest. And they just go really nicely on here. I'm, yeah. Again, I'm a little embarrassed. I'm, I'm both proud of this and embarrassed by it. Because I did all that work developing an alternate system that was completely unnecessary because this just works better. Because an idea is more complicated doesn't make it better. These are the lessons we have to learn from time to time. Asri, thank you so much for that resub. How are you doing tonight? Well, you know, we got there eventually. That's what matters. I leave the little puzzle piece connectors on there because, damn it, somebody might want to use them. I still want to use them. Actually, I like that they're on there because you can make oddly shaped units pretty easily. Is there a 2x3? Yes, there is, Dwegham. There is, um... I think I've got 1x2, 1x3, 2x2, 2x3, 3x3 are what's available. And I figured with those you can... Because the other thing you can do is, like, if you want to make it larger, you can always combine these, and then just all you're doing is moving big blocks of units instead of individual stands. So, if you print out a number of them, you'll have pretty much every shape you could need. This was my this was my tester. This This is not in there because this is fucking useless. This was only to determine sizing. In fact, I'm going to throw that away. Water gun in hand, preparing to soak some stupid kids. Oh, no! That's not very Halloween-y. Where have literally all of my flush cutters gone? Here we go. Sheza, I live in the middle of fucking nowhere. Nobody comes out here. If anybody did come out here, I'd be alerted on my camera system like 10 minutes before they got to the door. And that would be a very, very strange thing for them to be doing. How large is the two? Well, you know, it's the, the trays themselves are 66 millimeters across, so you can extrapolate that out, White Wolf. The 3x3 three three just fits cleanly on the uh, standard Neptune 2 or Ender 3 build plate. <laughs> it is kind of... You do the maths! To be fair, it's pretty easy maths. Resize in the yard. All three worn trick or treaters. If they knock on the door, ring the doorbell, they'll get soaked. Well, fair enough. As you said, at least you get a reward for it. I feel like I would consider that fair dues as a trick or treater. So we're just going to do these guys four at a time because that's what I've been doing so far. Who, do, who just said. Somebody was just, just saying. And I just barely saw it in chat. I bet I could scroll up and see it. Somebody has a 3D printable figure that is fairly close to the militia for this game. Now, I do like using... Um, in the case that I want to support a company like Parabellum, I do tend to use all official models if I can. But at the same time, I'm going to be using so many militia that I would not mind a link to some good, lowly, similar peasant folk that wouldn't look odd mixed in with these guys. Titan Forge. Okay. I'll have to check it out. Arkudaki. And a very happy Halloween to you as well. Old Town. I'll have to go check it out. Oh, I don't want the shields. What am I doing? Just gonna cut out the Bowman parts. Because I just need three trays of these guys. What I tend to do with these is I'll hold the sprue one way and I'll just clip everything that's on one side and then I'll flip it over and I'll do the rest of the clips. I 
And we'll get to stringing these bows here before long. An ogre with stand for the militia to ride. Oh my. Oh, thank you, Dweghom. I'll have to check that out. A lot more people. I'm glad to see the 3D printing community is moving away from making, like, only proxies for 40k. Because for the longest time, it was like, every single fucking maker is doing nothing but making proxies for 40k. And we finally have uh, a number of groups making, like, fantasy and medieval-style minis that aren't just for D&D. Because, again, for a long time you could find fantasy minis, but they were almost entirely intended to be, like, character proxies for Dungeons and & Dragons and not rank-and-flank armies. Well, you know, this is... There, there's... Even with 3D printing, you're hard-pressed to print a bowstring. It's just one of those things that... Like, I've seen some 3D printed bowstrings, but you also end up with print failures with things that fine a lot of the time. Oh, you'll see, Arkudaki. I've done, um... Here. I've done one whole group of them so far. So, I've got the process down pretty decently. I think they came out pretty well. Implementing the, uh, the, the, the archer's paradox with the arrow having to be on the opposite side of the draw. Used to use thin wire late been using model ship rigging. Yeah, I would think that model ship rigging, I mean, that's, you know, more or less what it's been intended for for years. A very similar application. Old tricks are the best tricks and all that. There are more than four heads on each of these, and I just don't care, so I just clip out four heads at random. They've got very, like, they're clearly meant to have the helmets glued on top of them, but they have, in some cases, very, very fine hair details. I'm gonna go ahead and try to paint them, just because uh, archery with a helmet on is fucking difficult. This will help differentiate them from the standard militia. I'm telling you, ever since I started using the 3D printer primer strings, like, I'm never going back. That's that's how I do bow strings from now on. Clippy, clippy, clip. How many arms is that? One, two, three, four bodies. One, two bows, two arms, four heads. Okay. Little SD to USB adapter crapped out. I'm sorry to hear that, Amish Stig. Uh, I try to keep uh, extras for connectors like that around just because, like, that's, you know, then you gotta either go get or order a new one. And you usually have a couple days of downtime, and that sucks. Hey, Gus Schultz. Welcome in, my friend. How you doing today? I take it. I take it that you were were quite uh, quite taken with the their rendition of the Sardaukar, Roland. I really like almost everything about the new Dune movie, 
Uh, mostly I have quibbles, and I really I don't feel like it's a good adaptation. I feel like it's a great companion piece, but not a great adaptation. And I only feel that way because as I watched it, it all made sense to me, and then I started to talking to people who hadn't read the book, weren't familiar with the story, and I realized how many things were left out. I was like, oh yeah, I guess they really didn't explain, like, a lot of shit, come to think of it. My wife thought that the Sardaukar were mercenaries, and I was like, oh no. Oh no, no, no. Oh, oh no. Oh, there's so much more going on than that. And admittedly, the parts of the book that they cut out were some of my favorites, which is gonna, you know, irritate me personally, but... That's the kind of quibbles where I look at it and I go, okay, so how would I do it? If I were going to fix this, what would I do better? And I'm forced to realize that, nope, they cut it out for a reason, okay. All that I'm left with is they probably should have made it a show instead, which I stand by. They, they should have. I also wish that they showed more confidence in the property by, by filming them all at once. Because, uh... I don't know, we got like a couple of years before the next movie comes out. I thought I thought Peter Jackson showed us better than this. Yeah, Asri, Yui and Tufer were barely in the movie. This this is this is where what little quibbles and complaints I can make come in. Um largely who's Gurney Halleck? Who's Dr. Yui? Who's Tufer Howitt? What the fuck is going What the hell? Like, they don't, they don't introduce any of these characters or explain anything about them. I don't think they said the word Mentat in the movie. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of show, don't tell. I am. I really am. But you have to show, and they kind of didn't. Yeah, Asri, they didn't once mention the Sook conditioning that made Dr. Yui trusted. It, it was, mm, yeah, it, it, it just, I was shocked when I was watching the movie when it came to the part, The Night of the Betrayal. Like, I literally was like, wait, is this it? Is this happening? Uh, Leto gets up and he looks out the window at the little flashing signal in the shield wall mountains. And I was like, well, already? Like, there's so much shit that hasn't happened. Oh, Mr. Square Peg, that is a controversial opinion. I really don't like... David Lynch's 1984 Dune. I think it's... Uh, I guess that's not true. I guess I do like it. It's just that it's it's the least of the movies that David Lynch ever made, in my opinion. <sighs> Did he really, Arkudaki? I wonder if um, Skullforge is going to get a C&D. Skullforge has an interesting business model. He, as far as I can tell, just browses social media for whatever is the most popular meme this week, and he makes a model of it. And man, I cannot, I cannot fault the prolific or quick nature of his work. But it's just a little weird. It's like anytime something is popular on the internet, it's like, oh, I wonder if Skullforge made a model. Oh, yep, he did. Yep, there it is. Okay. It makes me think sometimes I, I would love to see him make something of his own. He could do a great job at it. Because his models really are fucking super high quality. Of course, the other direction this might be going is maybe he's going to get fucking hired by a major company at some point and just work as a designer. I should have one of my mildly cut-resistant gloves on. Well, yeah, that's the thing, though, to Square, is you don't get much of Leto. Like, I, I loved what we got of the performance, but what we got of the performance was, like, I mean, how many lines did, did Oscar Isaac have? It couldn't have been that many. And they didn't expand on his and Jessica's relationship, like, at all. Manro Fasal, welcome in. Oh yeah, Arkudaki. He is one of the most successful Patreons I've ever seen. The guy's making like like 10k a month off of his Patreon. It's fucking nuts. Warning. 
Fingertips covered in super glue are not approved safety gear for handling razor blades. Let's just get our mold lines cleaned up here. They needed like any of the political intrigue in the book. Like any of it at all. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very, very stylish movie. It just it lacks a lot of the meat of Dune. A lot of the the, the generalities are there and the specifics are mostly missing. Now, you know, credit where due, things they did that were actually really clever. I did like the future visions of Jameis. That is, we're talking show, don't tell. That's a really subtle way of telling us, the audience, that not all of Paul's visions will come true. Man, Fasal, did I just thank you for that resub, or did I just skip right past that? Honestly, man, thank you so, so much. Howdy back to you. Thank you for the 17 months of support here at Thunderhead Studio. Much appreciated, my friend. It is, and that's the thing, Amateur Pain Hour. As I talk about this, like, I am quibbling. Because overall, it's a great movie, and you should watch it. Uh, I just tell people, you should watch it, but you should also either read the book or watch the Sci-Fi 2000 miniseries, because you'll get a more complete version of the story there. You're getting a much abridged version of the story, but a very pretty version of it in the, the new movie. Oh, okay, excellent. Yeah, we're talking, talking a little bit about Dune. Um, yeah, there were a few scenes where I couldn't tell what was going on, Asri, but that's just, uh, you know, that's modern style. That's Everybody's fucking doing that, that hyper-desaturated, washed-out, really, really dark colors these days. There weren't many bright colors in the movie at all. Rebecca Ferguson, I feel like, stole the whole fucking movie. Rebecca Ferguson's performance as Lady Jessica was amazing. She was great. Admittedly, we got more of her than almost anybody else, but she was phenomenal. Jason Momoa was he was he was Jason Momoa. Jason Momoa is always Jason Momoa. He performs the exact same fucking character in every single movie that he's in. It's like, hey, look, Aquaman on Arrakis. Sure, why not? How can you cut fade to square? This is my question. Like, they didn't include um, fade. They didn't include Princess Irulan at all. Yeah, they, they didn't include Count Fenring. Um, how do you cut Fade from the story? He's important. I don't, I don't really... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see a number of years because that's apparently how long it's going to be before we get the sequel, so... I don't know. Like, I enjoyed Dune, but I find it hard to get too excited about. Also... If I have one thing, one thing that I think is a genuine quibble, one issue that I will take with the movie, I do not like the future version of the Fadaiken. I do not like them. I don't understand why in Paul's future vision of his jihad, the Fadaiken are fucking Power Rangers. With, with Iron Man helmets. Like, why? That, it's not just that, oh, uh, special effects. It's that that doesn't make any sense thematically. That doesn't make any sense culturally for that to happen. It's a possible, yes, it is a possible future. He is seeing one of many paths. On this path, the Fadaiken are a bunch of fucking morons who waste a bunch of money on nonsense that they don't need and are generally kind of dumb. <laughs> like, uh, don't go that path, Paul. Choose the path where they just wear still suits because that's what they did because that makes sense. I don't know why you feel you need Iron Man armor, Paul. It was infinitely more complicated than the Sardaukar fighting suits. Roll the Sardaukar fighting suits 
were like environment suits with sealed bubble helmets and largely thick fabric. The Fadaikin armor was entirely computer-generated shifting armor plates and transforming helmets. It was an order of magnitude more complex and ornate than the Sardaukar armor. Which is... silly. That is precisely the opposite of what the Fadaikin were. They're not more ornate or more complex than anyone. They were simpler. That and, you know, Dune was PG-13. This new one, it's PG-13, and I think it shows. Because the, the, the fighting, like, I guess I can appreciate stylistically what they did with the shields. And the fact that everybody fights with blades because everybody has shields. Um, I don't think it's necessary. It wasn't in the books. But, like, I, I feel like I understand it. Again, stylistically, I think it, it works, particularly if you're looking to set this universe apart from other ones. Uh, okay, everybody uses swords because everybody has shields, fine. Um, but if that was going to be the case, and they were going to put the effort into having the fighting be interesting, first of all, it should have been rated R, so it didn't have to be fucking bloodless. And, and secondly, they should have put more time and effort into the choreography? Because I don't, I don't think it was very good. It really just, like, the fighting in Dune translates to everybody's gonna wave their arms around a whole lot, and they're gonna glow blue, and then every now and then someone's gonna glow red and fall down. That's it. It's, that's the whole thing. There weren't any, like, clever slow strikes or anything like that. It was just slash, slash, slash every 15th slash, for some reason, they're going to glow red and fall down. Uh, that's... that's uh, okay. <laughs> um, that's fine, I guess, but maybe don't put as much emphasis on the nature of their blade fighting if you're not going to put any effort into their blade fighting. They did, like, one good fight in the whole movie, and that was the training fight between Paul and Gurney. And I really, really noticed it when Duncan was fighting the Sardaukar. I'm like, things are just happening now. There's there's no reason for it at all. Well, that's the thing. If you follow that line of reasoning too far, it doesn't make any sense. There's, there's much more to shield combat, even in the books, too. There's uh, fast on defense, slow on attack... The notion that if someone's coming in for a slow strike, you can move against it quickly, adding your kinetic energy to the strike, thus deflecting it. Like, there's really, really complex fighting techniques that they just didn't feel like bothering with while also deciding to focus visually a lot of the movie on it. Like, it's strange choices. Well, that's true, Azri. Uh, the Harkonnen also shouldn't have been firing lasers from their ships at an ornithopter that was demonstrated literally in that exact same scene to have shields on it. That was maybe one of the most confusing shots in the movie. This is, this is where I enter into quibbles that don't matter. Before I say this, it doesn't matter. For the sake of the casual viewer, nobody's going to care. Um, but they literally show Duncan Idaho take off in his ornithopter, and he gets hit by a few kinetic rounds, and they show the shields. They show it, like a, a, someone went to a digital animator and said, we need this ship to take off and get hit and, and show shields around it. And he was like, okay, I'll do that for you. And he's like, okay, now later in that scene, I want it to be flying and they're going to be shooting a laser at it. And at no point did anyone say, hey, maybe we should pick one or the other. And again, I, I, don't, I don't think it really matters, but... As as a a book and story fan, it bugged me a little bit. It, uh, you know what? It didn't bug me so much. Uh, my problem with it is not that it like makes me mad. My problem with it is that it took me out of the scene. My problem is that I'm flowing with the movie. I'm enjoying myself. I'm going with it. I'm like, wow, this is cool. And then something happens, and I go, wait, what? Wait, what? That doesn't make any sense. And I don't want to be taken out of the goddamn scene. I was enjoying the movie. 
Same thing happened with Duncan's fighting. I'm like, oh, he's gonna fight the Sardaukar, this is really cool, and uh, oh, that, one, that guy died. Why? Wait, what, what did he do that was different that that guy died from? Hmm. Most people probably don't give a shit, and they probably shouldn't. I'm just picking my nits. Thought they were gonna have Duncan intersect his shield with the Laz gun they were using at the end. Yeah, because they were firing uh, a Laze gun to cut through the door, which the visuals on the laser was very cool. I thought their visual representation of the laser and the power that it put out was really quite neat. But that's the thing, like, I can't fault, there's one singular piece of visual design in the entire movie that I can fault, and the rest of it is like, oh no, it's perfect, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. Everything about the movie was beautiful and enthralling, with the, maybe the notable exception of the color palette and the Power Ranger suits. Which I still just don't understand. Or maybe, like, I feel like I do understand them, but if that is in fact the reason, that's disappointing. If it really just came down to, well, because they look cooler. We're gonna do it because Iron Man is popular. Like, that's not a good reason. That's that's a terrible reason to do that. Dune just made me mad. No, I liked it. I enjoyed watching it. It has a less than a handful of individual elements that took me out of the movie for a few seconds, and then I got right back into it, and I enjoyed it. And I think if you're a fan of the books, you will probably enjoy it too. I think if you're not a fan of the books, you'll probably enjoy it, but be a little bit confused, and you should just consume the books. You should do that anyway. Dune is a great book. I say books. You should read Dune. You should never read Messiah. You should never read Children of Dune. People will tell you otherwise, they're wrong. Everything that happens after Dune is kind of dumb. <laughs> oh, the music and sound design was pretty phenomenal, too. This is the one movie where I'm like, yeah, Hans Zimmer, yeah, you did, you did good, you did a good job. Dune was more of a cinematic, scenic movie than a movie... Yes. Uh, Avash, I say uh, the, the most kind way I can put it is to say that I feel like the new... Denis Villeneuve, Dune, is a very experiential film. And I think it is. I think you just, you just go with it, and you take in the visuals, and you soak in the drama, and you enjoy it. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. If you want the particulars and the political intrigue, you're going to have to get that somewhere else. I heard that as well, Dwegham, and if that does happen, I'll... I fucking... I pass. I, I pass. Uh, no thank you. I read Messiah. I was very, very frustrated by it. I read Children of Dune. I was very, very frustrated by that as well. I made it all the way through Heretics to Chapter House. And, uh, that's a series of books that I wish I could go back in time and erase from my fucking brain, if I'm being honest. It... I feel like Dune... ends. The story of Dune effectively ends at the end of Dune. Could you write more? Yes. Should you? Apparently not. Do you need to? Absolutely not. It, it has a complete arc to it. I felt like everything after that kind of cheapened the first book. Now, it's also in a unique position that I don't think those books were really... I'm not going to say they're bad, I just didn't like them, and I, I, I you know, I, I feel like you story-wise, kind of better off without them. Um, it wasn't until Chapter House that I think they really became kind of bad. Uh, I think Frank Herbert was, like, battling dementia and writing at the same time, I'm not sure. And, um, then it wasn't until his son started writing in his stead that the Dune books became unfucking readable I can remember the moment. I can remember the moment when I realized, oh, these are bad. And I'm reading a book, and it's written by, what's his name, Brian Herbert? And there's a trial going on. I don't remember what the trial was over, but a character is being tried for something, and he's in a court of law. And the judge bangs his laser gavel. And I remember this moment, because I remember reading the words, laser gavel. Laser gavel. Laser gavel. 
laser gavel. What the fuck is a laser gavel? I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I am, I am, I, uh, what the fuck? <laughs> Jamie the Marine, thank you so much for the follow, man. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. And here's the thing. Frank Herbert had a lot of crazy ideas. And he had a lot of interesting ideas about technology and world building. Oh, 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 thank you. Thank you. Yeah, exactly, Jamie. What the fuck is a laser gavel? He had a lot of funny ideas about technology and a lot of interesting technological concepts that were kind of off the wall. But here's the thing. He never invented a technology that didn't need to exist. Everything that he put into his books made sense within the context of the books, filled a need. And there were a number of technologies that were just like, it was good enough back then, it's good enough now. And then his son was like, you know what this hammer needs? <laughs> Lasers. <sighs> How do you implement lasers into a gavel? This is Sonic Screwdriver level of fuckery. The Sonic Screwdriver is ironic. Because ever they'll, they'll have jokes. Where he'll be like, it's like a screwdriver, but it's more Sonic. And you're like, ah, it's funny, because it doesn't make any sense. The laser gavel was totally serious. Uh, thank you for the reminder, Data Nerd and Avash. Laser gavel is to doom, but Taser Face is to Guardians of the... No, because Taser Face was funny. <laughs> Taser Face was amusing in that... that, um, that that pathos sort of way, the, the the juxtaposition of a character who takes himself very seriously with a, a fundamentally silly concept. Look, I'm not saying Taserface was the peak of comedy, Dwegham. What I'm saying is that Taserface got me to go, <laughs> Taserface. Whereas Laser Gavel made me stop reading a book series. Or perhaps more accurately, I can say that Taserface, whether you like the joke or not, is in a movie that's full of silly jokes, very much like Taserface. Laser Gavel was in a series of books that took itself seriously. These are two very different situations. Either way, at that point, I, uh, I, I, stopped. I stopped reading those books. Now, this is not to say that I am some some arbiter of quality literature. I read real fucking garbage, but the garbage that I read generally knows that it's garbage. And that book did not. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Jamie. All right, all right. Get a, get a couple of swigs in there. Thank you very much for the reminder. Laser fork. Yeah, there we go. I can see that, Dweghom. I'm just saying, it's like that—that's a bad joke in a in a movie with jokes in it. This was just fucking stupid. Ah, oof. You know what? After this, I'm gonna have a Shiner. No, Roland. I just picked up a 12 pack of Shiner Bach, and I've been enjoying that flavor of Texas. That's a great question, Roland. Um, did they cast the Emperor or Irulan? They cast characters that didn't need to be in the movie, but then they didn't cast characters that should have been in the movie, which I found a little bit confusing. <laughs> um, I'm really, really hoping that uh, Dave Batista and Stellan Skarsgård have something... Well, I mean, they, they do. They have more to do in the second part of the story, but... I felt like Stellan Skarsgård didn't get to do shit. He got to grumble a couple of lines. Man, see, that's, this is the thing that kind of gets me, though still is that Dune I and this is just reinforced by having watched the movie no Jamie the Marine these uh, I do have a number of Middle Earth miniatures since you mention it these minis are from a fairly new game from Parabellum War Games called Conquest the last argument of kings here I have uh, some household knights from the range for my hundred kingdoms force all done up on their trays and stands I'm building some Militia Bowmen right now. I have a painted Theist Priest from the same range right here. This is one of my, my hero models. 
they're a little bit larger scale than the Middle Earth minis. But, but like I said, there's... I was concerned, and this is, again, as I complain about Dune, please let me reiterate, I like the movie. This is one of those situations where I'm complaining about it because as I watched it, I was like, yeah, but you were, like... It, it's frustrating when someone gets really, really close to greatness. Or it's frustrating when someone does something great, and then there's just one or two things about it that's like, but why did you do that? Like, oh, if you had just done uh, just a little, like, if you had just done something, like, eh, eh, uh, you know what I mean? And, um, those little items. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Have you seen these, Dwaycom? These are my retinue upgrades. So this represents combat and arcane level two. Uh, I also have, where are my other ones? I think I put them away. Oh, no, they're right here. They're magnetic upgrades. Boop, they come right off. Like so. Because these hero trays have extra magnets in the base here. Three slots of them. And so you can be like, well, I want to have a tactical upgrade level three. There you go, you got your tactical level three right there. You want to have uh, combat level three. You got your combat level three right there. So you got like, okay, I've got... Arcane 2 and Combat 2. You just magnetize those right on. And the goal of these was to have upgrades that specifically, very specifically, your opponent can tell what they are from five feet away. Because that's something that really frustrates me about visual representations of upgrades on models. Uh, they're not really useful unless I can tell what they are when I'm standing at the table. Yeah, that's what they said, Roland. Uh, I will have lost interest long before that, and I suspect other people might have as well. They are, yes, Wegham. Those are included in my new Old Market Road base set. The next base set that I'm going to be releasing is going to be themed around the Spires. I am working on it presently. I'm basically recreating a lot of H.R. Giger art. I think you'll like it. Uh, Jamie, you can always hit exclamation point STL to get a readout of what's actually on my printer. It's something kind of boring today. It's it's one of these. It's just a regiment tray connector for Conquest. You can see it right here when I lift up this unit of Household Knights because they're all on a central tray and I can just go ahead and lift them right up and out of there. But it, it keeps them all together when they're on the tabletop. Oh, Roland, that's just because you're old. Now, uh, I've got to get this Conquest stuff done this month specifically, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do more Battletech. I still make a lot of Battletech stuff, Roland. My problem is I don't paint my own stuff anymore, it seems like. It's a little crazy, isn't it? Hey, uh, Kellis, how you doing? Thought of doing score counters, had an idea of something like broken shields and torn banners on a small hill. That's an interesting idea. That is certainly an interesting idea. I, I almost always fall back to just using dice. Um, and that's what stops me from a lot of accessories like that is when I personally am like, yeah, but I'd rather just use a die. I often won't bother with it, but I'll stew on that idea and maybe something will come of it. <laughs> What's up, Carbonic Acid? How you doing, man? The Storm Chasers are not forgotten. They have a space of honor on my display shelf. Is it weird that I have a problem with the signpost on the priest tray? Is the sign following him around the battlefield? Yes. Well, I mean, is it really that much stranger than tactical rocks following people around the battlefield? Uh, you don't you don't have to use it. I include um, that's actually a, an empty slot on the tray, and you can put in either that piece 
or you can put in this piece along with this base or you can just put in a blank stone and have it be plain. And a good evening to you as well, Crossbone Roof. It is a sign... Crossbone Roof? Ooh, weird. It is a sign of his majesty and magic. Dwegham, I like the way you think. Jamie the Marine, um... Do I know about Warhammer? That's a very broad question. I think I can safely say yes. Though I suppose it depends on what specifically you mean. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I've been I've been I've been tabletop gaming for a long time. And I have been in and out of Warhammer at various times over the course of that. I'm not going to rant about Warhammer. I've been I've been complaining about Dune long enough. If I then switch to complaining about Warhammer, I won't have any audience left. Look, I can't hate everything that's popular. I mean, I guess I can. At some point, people will think I'm being disingenuous. They just don't realize how much of a fucking curmudgeon and a contrarian I actually am. It's a big hammer you hit people with. Oh, I forgot her. I'm so glad we have you here to answer these questions. Paint build Warhammer at the moment. Uh, Warhammer 40k or Age of Sigmar out of curiosity? Well, this is something that I'm I'm prepared for, Dwegham 2, is the... Um, oh, amateur paint hour, thank you. Is the inevitable waves of, oh my god, Dune is set in the Warhammer 40k universe because they go through the warp when they travel through the fold space. <laughs> like, I'm absolutely waiting for that. Oh, they've got a space emperor in Dune. It's just like Warhammer. <laughs> I'm waiting for that. Maybe people will surprise me and it won't happen. Uh, eventually people are going to realize that Warhammer just ripped off every single concept that it has from someplace else. It combined them in an interesting way, and it got some really, really good artists to make it look good, but it ripped everything off. That's, like, I, I, this is the thing, is they didn't even used to try to hide it. I only build and semi-paint my models. Achilles, oh shit, that hits way too close to home, man. Oh, oh, I have to drink more. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to miss the redemptions. I'll just finish off my beer. How about that? Go get myself a shiner. the in inspiration for Space Marines, so you could take that in a few different directions. There are a number of 1960s, 1970s pieces of sci-fi that involve big power-armored Space Marines jumping around and shooting rockets. I think one of the most obvious would be Starship Troopers with their Marauder suits, which most people don't associate with Starship Troopers because of the Paul Verhoeven movie that does not involve the Marauder suits at all. Um... What is... I'm trying to think of the name of a book series. I can see the cover of it. It's a man in a silver armored suit and like a bubble helmet and there's a planet behind him and like this big beam of light shooting up. And it was called... I, I don't remember. It was almost entirely about the power armored suit though. And he was basically a space marine. Was it just called armor? It was something like that. Roland. 
but I can't remember. And then they just took a bunch of, like, uh, gothic monk knight concepts and kind of rolled them over. And, and see, this is the thing. I'm not saying that Warhammer 40k isn't fun. It absolutely is. Everything that it did with all of its inspirations is a lot of fun. I played it for a long time. I, I loved it. Uh, maybe my biggest problem with Warhammer 40k is that it has forgotten how to be fun lately. <laughs> but that's entirely a personal opinion and not objective at all. I encourage people to play Warhammer 40k. Um, I build and prime for 12 hours. Jamie, again, way too close to home, man. This, wait, you mean there are games we can play with these minis? Oh my god. Uh, I encourage people to play 40k because you know what 40k has? For people who don't give a shit about all the stupid little things that bug me in my weird neurotic ways, um, good return on investment. You play Warhammer, you play Warhammer 40k, you can always find a game locally, and that is worth the fucking world to someone who is just getting into tabletop wargaming. I would rather support a company that I don't particularly like, and have a player get a good gameplay experience, than encourage people to be hipsters like me, and play games that nobody plays. Which is one of the reasons I'm glad Conquest is doing as well as it is, because this game, Conquest, The Last Argument of Kings, you can find games of it, which is fucking amazing for a game this new. It's actually got a good amount of popularity, and I'm really trying to encourage it. Because there are not enough fantasy games out there. There are almost no real popular rank and plank games. There's like Kings of War by Mantic, which is great. But, I don't know, it, it never really captured people's imagination all that much. I think recently it's done well because of the Halfling Army they released. Which is admittedly very, very fun, very clever. I have not played First Blood, DFW. I, I have not tried it. Paint a 4,000 point Space Wolf's army. Dude, Space Wolves are such a great, such a great color scheme and such a really fun army to build and have been for years. Good for you, man. Completed armies always feel fucking great, don't they? I don't have anywhere near enough of them. I do better with skirmish forces. Yeah, Privateer Press, uh, I mean, you know, I understand why people say that about it, Achilles. I play Privateer Press games. I play Warcaster, and I play Monster Apocalypse. At the same time, I, I see why people get that impression. Privateer Press had a really, really good run with War Machine, where you couldn't go to a gaming store without seeing War Machine being played, and it took a big hit. It's not dead by any stretch of the imagination, but it does not have the momentum that it had when it was really popular. And people conflate the lack of momentum with being dead. These are not the same things. Hell, uh, Maelstrom's Edge isn't dead, and you can't find anyone playing Maelstrom's Edge. Like, to truly kill a game takes a lot of effort. Nice! Admac is a great army, too. I really like the... I think that the best models in the 40k range right now are Admac and Gene Stealer Cultists. Some of the most creative and fun sculpts that they have. Yeah, and that's that's the surest sign that the game is having trouble, Dwegom, is if people don't play it, they're not going to carry it. But it, it survives. Uh, Warcaster is seeing some play. Warcaster, like, I feel for Privateer Press in that I think Warcaster has gotten a little bit of the attitude from people who were like, mm, War Machine is dead, Warcaster is dumb. They didn't really try the game. It's a very different game, and it's actually a lot of fun. has a lot of cool lore. Their Kickstarter uh, is fulfilling here pretty soon, their third Kickstarter. I'm really looking forward to getting my book and my extra models from that one for my uh, Turnus Continuum. Someday, Vergata Rung will finish. Dude, Vergata Rung, you finish way more models than I do, man. Uh, fuck someday, you'll finish that, like, in a couple of months. Too many haters with loud voices. Oh, I feel attacked. Arkudaki, off to bed. I'll do my best, man. I'll do my best. You have a fantastic night. Arkudaki, it is always lovely to see you in chat, man. I hope you have a, a happy Halloween and sleep well. This may be my... Uh, I, I don't like where they put the sprue connection on this arm because it's between these fingers and I kind of got to chop down between them. Because I actually use this palm to hold an arrow. I 
always run the risk of chopping the thumb off. Cutting things out with a blade like this, you just cut little V-shaped wedges, bring it together, and sort of pry the piece out. It works pretty well. There we go. That'll do. Alright, one more arm, then I can start assembly. Like a sci-fi game that doesn't cost a paycheck for two boxes. Uh, Dwegham, can I recommend something? And let me recommend this to anybody out there who is like, I'd like an easy to play, fun, sci-fi skirmish level game. Check out Mantic's Dead Zone. They just, and I mean like October 25th, just released the third edition of Dead Zone. And it's a fucking great game. It's, it's genuinely a really, really cool game. It's, it's um, I'd like to play some of it on the stream. I've been kind of waiting for the new rulebook to release. It should be getting sent to me now. So here, as soon as I can get the game room up and actually running, which, by the way, the last of my new cameras should have arrived today, so I'm hoping to have good news on that. Uh, oh, oh, also, by the way, I got that new USB 3 card installed. I went through two additional ones. I finally got one that runs on its own SATA power cable, and you know what? It fucking works! I get my streaming rig out in the game room is actually working now with all of the cameras at once and no significant problems, so I'm I'm thrilled. I was I was really embarrassed when Hethrier came up and I tried to record a game and the whole thing just ate itself alive. That sucked. I was like, oh I've gotta I've gotta start over. Revelation Skirmish, yes to Square. It is always good to mention Revelation Skirmish. I mention that specifically to those of us who have resin printers, because man, if you want if you want a pretty badass war game that you can print all your own figures for, check out Revelation Skirmish. I'm a shtig, yes, that is my complaint every single time. The latest thing is the worst thing to happen since the last latest thing. Ooh, it sounds like you have a problem, but then so do we all, Jamie. So do we all. Ooh, excuse me. I want ladylike. Uh, Dead Zone 3rd Edition, though, looks pretty fucking great. I haven't played 3rd Edition yet, but it looks really good. 2nd Edition was... The rules were good, the balance in the army lists was bonkers. But they addressed that. Dune skirmish game win. Uh, give it time, Roland. <laughs> give it time. All right, let's do some assembly here. I need to string some bows. I am not going to do any of these as drawn in firing position. These are all going to be relaxed. So, what I'll do is I'll pick a point up here. Uh, there, and I kind of saw into it a little bit with the blade. First one way, and then this way. Very gentle when you do this. Use a sawing or pushing motion. And I mean pushing the blade along rather than in, because you can cut through this styrene very easily if you're not careful. All we're trying to do is take off a portion of this curved surface and leave a little flat spot, right, right like that. And then another one on the opposite arm. Just a little bit with the tip of the blade. Okay. Now, what I do is I save these primer strings that are left over from doing 3D prints. Usually you just throw them away, they're waste.
but I strung the bows on some of my Lord of the Rings uh, Rangers of Middle-Earth and Mordor Orcs once and realized that these are fantastic for that purpose. So let's see if I can do it as well as I was doing it by myself. Jamie the Marine, hang on. You know what? You know what? I'm gonna go get another beer. I need another beer. You know what, Jamie? You're right. I like the cut of your jib. I'll be right back. does taste like Texas right there. It's like all I drank when I was down there. Alright, let's see here. Dab a glue at that connection point. Now these these printer strings are kind of flat. They're slightly oblong, so I use that flat as my just to go along with the the, the plane of the bow. I'll hold it a little closer. Work that into my glob of glue. Alright, so it's starting to hold, but it hasn't set, so what I'll do is I'll take it and sort of lay it along the length here. And then I let one end set. So I want that glue that I just touched it to, I want that to set. And then I'll come back to it. Because what I do next is I'll come in with a pair of clippers and I'll clip this short and then I'll glue it to the other position there. And this creates a nice, rigid, easily painted bowstring that appears to be good and taut. There we go. On to the next one. Now this one's a little bit more complex because if you see where the plane of the bow is, crosses through the forearm. This was never intended to be strung, but what I do is I cut, and you can see it. Here, let me show you one of the guys I did with this arm set here. Basically, I cut a little notch in the forearm there. And then the bowstring kind of passes into it, but it's really not noticeable. It actually makes the whole model a little stronger. You're talking about the old one, Manro Fasal? On Xbox One? Yeah, the Lord of the Rings battle game is, like, from the early 2000s when Lord of the Rings really kicked off. Yeah, these bowstrings are my favorite bowstrings, Wigham. I This is my favorite way to do it. Assuming the model isn't designed completely obtusely, it's generally pretty easy to do. Then yes, man, Rufflesall, I remember that one. That's the one where if you got too crazy and you pulled out your gun, you'd shoot yourself in the head. I like that one. That one was a lot of fun. Like, as your insanity meter built up, if you had your gun out, your character would start, like, kind of, like, looking at it a little bit more, and he would examine it more closely. <laughs> and then eventually he would just go, uh, <laughs> It's fucked up. Oh, uh, Roland, yeah, as far as things they did right, Javier Bardem as Stilgar is, mm, oh, oh, he's beautiful. He's amazing. I, I, I loved his version of Stilgar. I want more of that. I just like Javier Bardem, though. He's... He's... Yeah. I liked him as far back as, like... 
collateral with Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx, you know? Now, so the trick here is I'll sort of use my blade to draw a line between my two connecting points. And that lines up about like that, and then I'll push the blade into the forearm to give myself a mark. And then you sort of cut yourself out of V-shape along that. Come at it from one direction, and then move over slightly, and try to come down to the same point. Cut this little notch out with his arm. Now the other option is you can heat these bow arms and try to move them. Now that is something that I have done with a few of these when I wanted to do drawn bows, which I can show you here. You will note, for instance, that this bow, the arms are much more flexed than they are on the standard bow. Now you don't have to do this, even if you want to do drawn bows, because this is the kind of detail that literally nobody's ever gonna fucking notice. Nobody. This is me being crazy. Um, it's just that this is how bows flex when you draw them, and so that's how I wanted to do it. This is also a little bit more complex to do the stringing. Um, what you have to do, I'm not going to do one of these strings on tonight's stream, but if there's anybody here who is curious about doing the drawn bow string, it's not two pieces. What you do is, and I'll demonstrate... on a piece of scrap here, hang on. I think this is set by now, so I'll finish attaching this and then I'll demonstrate on the scrap that's left over. Oh, well, that's not gonna be scrap, that's actually another good one, damn it. I need one that I'm not gonna use. Here, this one sucks. This is a little bit different if you're going to do the drawn bowstring. What I'll usually do is I'll take the back end of the blade, like so, and my finger, and I'll just put a little kink. Put a little kink in it. Bend it further than you need because it's going to relax back to a shallower angle. And you have this shape here. See that? You attach this point first. And then you cut and attach to the arms of the bow. Not fair that it's already Monday there. Steely, you have to live in the shittiest of futures. And that future is Monday. Steely Rebel, welcome in. It's always a pleasure to see you. I hope that you are having a good day. A decent Monday so far. Thank you so much for getting that shout out, Data Nerd. Alright. This is mostly set, so I'm going to go ahead and try to clip it. This is a little bit of a fiddly part, because you can kind of easily pull it free, but you just kind of eyeball how long this needs to be, and then give it a quick clip. Try not to, try not to lose the extra bit, which I might have done there. Ah, whatever, you wind up with plenty of them. That is actually a tiny bit too long. Fit. It is just a tiny bit too long, so I'm just going to clip the very end off of it. Very nice, very light. Clip. There we go. That'll fit beautifully. And just come in under that, put a little dab of super glue. anybody's wondering, literally everything I'm doing here is not only optional, but not expected at all, so don't think you have to do this. This is just what I like to do. Now, we have a nicely strung bow, and this will paint up well and take paint decently. Alright, back to working on this one. Nice autumn day. I'm glad to hear it, Steela Rebel. We have had a particularly overcast day today. 
of our first ones of the season. Just kind of gouging this little furrow out of his forearm here, which I'm going to fill with a bowstring. Visually lining it up. Okay. Hey, Sumatha, it's good to see you. All right. That seems like it'll line up. You definitely want it to line up just so, because you need the bowstring to appear taut and thus straight. So I'm actually going to widen this slightly. If you get a little bend to it, then it just doesn't look quite right. You know, they are. I had I had kind of a shitty week, but it has come back together. And by Halloween, all is right in the world. Now for this, I'll usually do two dabs. I'm going to line it up with one. And then I'm going to try to drop it into the furrow on the arm. This can be kind of a, a fiddly glue job. So, you know, just... If you're doing this, be slow and methodical. Contacting all the points that it needs to. And wait for that to set, and then I can glue that other piece there. This is way more work than these models need. I just, uh... Yeah, I'm a little obsessive sometimes. Cut our notches for our bow strings here. For whatever reason, the unstrung bows are just one of those modeling conventions that bug me. You know? There are a lot of silly things in model making that I'm willing to overlook as an abstraction, but the unstrung bows just... I don't know. They've always bugged me. I indulged in a lot of wacky solutions over the years, including bits of string soaked in super glue and all kinds of funny tricks. And then I started 3D printing, and I was like, oh, this is, this is, this, this is better. I should just do this. Methodical and slow with this. This is a very fiddly process. Sometimes it sticks to your finger. Oh, that's not right. Nope, that's not right. Warning fingertips covered in super glue are not approved safety gear for handling razor blades. They're not, but they've also saved my bacon a time or two, so you know. Take from that what you will. Come on. Get that lined up. And the reason I cut the notch is because this glue works best with a maximum amount of surface contacts. So you have one flat of the primer string. And then you have one little tiny flat spot on the bow, and the glue will bond better that way. 
It's offset. Burn it all down. Oh, no, this one is a waste. Put it in the fucking trash. How dare I... How dare I dream? Let's see if you can just get the one and then wait for that to set. Then that will be firm enough to clip the other one without a problem, usually. Once the glue sets, they're actually pretty strong. Those are channel points, which are a, uh, a Twitch thing, Dwegham. We have a couple silly things you can redeem them for. This is probably the weakest element of my streaming on Twitch, is I've never... I'll tell you, for a while, in the beginning, in the fucking golden days, I would let people redeem Twitch uh, channel points for me to then paint models for them. And, and while I kept up the motivation to do it, we actually got some really cool ones painted. But... It didn't last forever. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can you can tell me to check my posture. You can make me drink beer, and you can at this moment redeem uh, extra entries in the storm report. Open mouth, insert drink. Oh my god, you guys! I'm not I'm not very good with the channel points. I'll be the first to admit it. Ah, there's some streamers out there who have healthy things in it, like, redeem channel points and I'll do push-ups. Um, yeah, fuck that. <laughs> nah, man. I'm not that moto. Well, we're glad to have you here, Dweg Hump. Yeah, there's a bunch of, like, Twitch has its own, like, culture and, and doodads and this and that, you know? I do have the audio clips. That's the funny thing, Steeler Rebel. Like, a smarter man would have made it so you redeem channel points to play the audio clips. I didn't do that. All you have to do is subscribe to my channel, and then you can do the audio Studio, clips. We specialize in turning your shame into more shame. And more and more and more. I guess I could, like, have it redeemed so you could play video clips, but I like having control over these ones. You know, there's something about mech paint jobs that really just brings a tear to my eye, and sometimes a tightness to my pants. Oh god. This stream has a lot of the latter. <laughs> I need to... I need to feed, um... Chaotic, some fresh ideas. We we should update the voice clips. We should we should have some new ones. Welcome back to Fifty Shades of Coal Gray. And as he pulled his stiff bristles out of my wet fluids, I yelled out, "No, Thunderhead! You need to thin that paint first. Really, is my favorite book. We did we did some solid memeing in the early days of the stream. We haven't we don't have any any recent memes that are, that originated, you know, organically. See medieval bonk simulator had a pumpkin head of it. Yeah, I did see that. I haven't I haven't played in it, <laughs> but uh, I did see that. I'll set this here. Hopefully that will set nicely. Let's come back to this one. Clip it and glue it. I 
because this channel is devoid of originality. I'm not uh, even going to pretend that that's not true. Jamie, uh, mostly I paint. I don't do build streams very often. It's just that right now it's what I need to be doing. The vast majority of the streams on here are me painting things. And if you're curious, you can always check out the VODs. Uh, all of our streams are recorded. And you can catch them right here on Twitch for up to a month. If you look down below my, my channel window there. Or if you go onto my YouTube, I upload them there. I hope Silver got a room. I hope so. I would hate for something as silly as gainful employment to distract you from hanging out on Twitch with your buddies who paint fantasy men from games where we roll dice to see who kills who. That would be a shame. There. Nice and clean. You're not wrong. You're not wrong to square. In fact, uh, yeah, Jamie, if you come back... So we stream here, generally speaking... Um, line this up here. Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday, depending on which way you want to arrange it. Most of them are going to be painting streams. If you want to see some painting, I'm going to be doing some oil painting... Uh, this Tuesday. I've been doing a lot of oil painting in the last few months. But I'm finally starting to get good results out of it, so. How you doing, Captain Gingerbeard? There we go. Nice and clean. One more. Yes, 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 the supercell. That is right. So, and in fact, I messaged Steela Rebel about this. Uh, we're doing the supercell painting stream this week. It is either going to be Tuesday or Thursday. I'm thinking Thursday as of right now, but I need to coordinate with Steela and make sure that we're good for that. Uh, I will be announcing a time because we're probably going to start a little bit late since she is in the upside down and our time zones don't exactly intersect cleanly. But uh, yes, we are going to be printing and painting the same mini at the same time. We have done it once before and had an absolute fucking blast. And you are all invited to print and paint along. It is a freely available miniature that you can download on the interwebs, print out at home paint right along with us. And then for any of you who do participate, who print out this mini and paint as we do, we are going to have a Supercell Storm Report approximately one week later where everybody who has participated shares their results and we can sort of talk about what it was like to work on the model. It gets some more meaningful discussion. I always find that I get more meaningful discussion on painting when we have worked on the same physical model. You can talk about what parts worked, what techniques you tried, what you were going for, etc., etc. But consider doing it on a Friday. We almost never do anything on a Friday, though, to Square. You madman. But yeah, if you're interested in the Supercell, which um, I think is probably... We're, 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 we're going to do it a number of times, no matter what. We've got about ten people, it looks like, interested in participating this time, but we're going to run a few of them. It's sort of born of the last time Steela, Rebel, and I did a multi-stream in which we worked on... Um, this Judge Dread bust. We painted this at the same time and sort of talked about it while we worked and then finished it up and compared. And um, this was a lot of fun because Steela Rebel and I both went for... We, we chose different artistic inspirations for Judge Dread. I did more of the Simon Bisley and she did more of the Nick Percival comic book style art. But I'm really happy with how this came out. Hey, 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 cat and skull fairy, both. I hope it's both. I hope it's both, because they're both pretty damn cool. 
How are you doing today? I hope you're having a happy Halloween. Hello there. All right, time to glue some militia. Bought the Aliens board game today, currently assembling the hell out of some Marines. I was impressed at the quality of the minis in that board game, Captain Gingerbeard. I have it myself. I was not expecting them to be as good as they are. If I had, if I have one complaint, it's that the aliens are kind of integrated into their bases, but... Eh. Eh, who cares, you know? Did you have fun, Cat? I hope you did. Dab of plastic glue. I'm gonna go ahead and pick a bow arm. Let's go with this one. Now these are styrene models, so I am using plastic cement, which I recommend. For any styrene model, it really is the best glue you can use. It has a decent amount of give to it. A long set time, so you can kind of change your mind a little bit. Jamie? It's a pretty cool game, too. Um, once I get mine put together, I wouldn't mind playing some sort of teleplay games of it. It seems like a good time. I need to match his arm up, because they do come in arm sets. That arm goes with this one. Yep, okay. See, this glue, as I've mentioned before, melts the styrene chemically on both sides so that it bonds together into one solid piece of plastic. What this means, functionally though, is that once you glue it, it'll stick pretty nice, but it'll still have some flexibility. Like I can still grab this arm and move it around and change its position quite a bit, or pull it off entirely. And in fact, all the way through the setting for a few hours, you can still take a blade, kind of wiggle it between, and pry the arm off and then re-glue it, no problem. Jamie the Marine, this specifically, this is an ancient bottle of Model Master liquid cement that I'm using, but basically any uh, styrene glue or plastic cement will work. I'll pick a head entirely at random. So he's kind of looking in that direction. Move his head back so he doesn't have a hunchback. There we go. What else do I need to attach? I need to attach a quiver. I have two quivers here. I'm usually putting one on the hip and one on the back. I'm going to put one on his back since his hip is kind of occupied by his arm. Oh god. It's easy enough to do. Just a nice fat glob of cement on the... Oh, I keep dropping it. Why do I keep doing that? Probably because I'm trying to hold it between like my ring finger and my pinky, which are not the most dexterous of fingers, but there we go. Big old glob. The nice thing about this plastic cement is you really, you get some of it, and then you just rub two pieces of plastic together enough, and they will bond. Oh, they will. You give it some time and some pressure, it'll work.
Maximum surface contact area is ideal. But that's true of all glue jobs, just broadly speaking. The over-the-shoulder quiver is actually really fucking inconvenient if you've ever tried to wear one. The hip quiver is, is vastly superior, but I don't care because he's not a real person. Huzzah, Bowman! Yeah, not conducive to the quick... Yeah, like, it is... That's a good way to put it, Sumatha. It's great for traveling. Your quiver over your shoulder is real comfortable for, like, walking around. Having your sword over your shoulder is real comfortable. The second you try to draw it and you're, like... Like, spinning in a circle because you naturally drop your right shoulder back when you reach back with your right arm. But when you drop your right shoulder back, you then move it further away from your hand. So you have to, like, keep your shoulder forward and also reach your hand back. And then you've got to draw it, but also kind of flex away from it and curl your abdomen. Like, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's awkward as fuck. Interestingly enough, they actually show that really well in Robin Hood Men in Tights. <laughs> they have the, the, the peasants learning to fire bows, and there's one of them who just keeps going like, oh. Oh, and spinning in circles trying to grab an arrow. <laughs> Modified a quiver for a friend to be used as a hip style, and he keeps uh, keeps trying to wear it wrong. Oh no, the hip quiver is really, like, really convenient. The hip quiver is just like easy draw. Been painting and building since you got up. Productive day, Jamie. I'm glad to hear that, man. I'm glad to hear that. Productivity is the name of the game. Sometimes. When the name of the game isn't Warhammer. Or Conquest. Or Warcaster. Set him over there to... Let his glue set. And let's build another one. You know, there's one thing I should be doing. There's one thing I should be doing before I do any of this. And you know what? I'm going to do it before I glue this shit on. I pin all my models to their bases. And it's much, much easier to do if you do it before you attach all the little fiddly bits. So I'm gonna drive some little pilots here. Oh god, excuse me. How many bowmen do I have on my table? So I've built 12, I'm building 12 more, and then I'm done. I got four being constructed currently. Um, this is just a little... I, I got this for something entirely different. This is like a carving stylus. It has a tungsten carbide tip with a sharp point, and it has a magnet on the back end. I use it now, uh, after its original purpose is long gone. Um, I use it for making little pilot divots for drilling in plastic and resin, and then I use this magnet on the back end for magnetizing things. It helps me keep my polarity consistent. And then I use my little uh, Tamiya electric handy drill. I love this thing.
the original purpose, I was using it to, um, at the time, I was doing a little bit of scrimshaw, actually. I was using it to uh, carve bone. That was a short-lived hobby. Alright, that's deep enough. You want to be very careful when you line this up. It's very easy to get off alignment and draw out the side of a leg. But if you're careful, I try to get a good depth. Now, okay. You can actually see the angle I got in here is bad, and it's going to come out the side of his leg. And you watch. You can see the styrene on the side of his leg starting to turn white right there. That means that my tip is close to the surface, so I'm going to ease back before I come out of the side. That's still, that's a good pilot hole for a pin for styrene, that's just fine. But I didn't want to push it any further. Cut the gangrene, get the bone saw! And then I'll, I'll after I've, I've assembled these guys, and in fact, well, I'm not gonna be able to base them. Uh, cause I need to prime them first. But, like, all these guys are drilled into their bases. You can see each and every one of them has at least one spot where I've drilled through the base, I've run the pin all the way through, I've glued it, and I've clipped it. Just gives them a little, a little, little bit extra. Oh, zombie brush. Oh, zombie brush. How you doing today, man? Which one, Dwegom? Which model are you talking about? I'll usually rub these around a little bit because what I like to do is just spread the cement so that all the seams are full. If the seams are filled with the cement just right, you won't actually have much of a seam on your final model. Because anywhere that the glue gets is going to wick some of the plastic material into it and harden up. I can get away with putting an arrow on this hand. Maybe? Oh, we'll see. The pointy hat one. Oh, these are 3D prints. These are my proxies for Sakari. Dwegon. Since the, the conquest model for Sakari doesn't exist yet, I did these guys. They're like crazy cultists with blades. The Comet Lord, that was his name. That's the name of the guy who did those. They're on uh, my mini factory. I 
knew I'd think of it eventually. So now this may or may not work. A few of the times when I've put drawn or being loaded arrows onto this guy. Sometimes I have to modify the arm. Oh, this 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 can work. This can work. It won't be perfect, but you know, it was never gonna be perfect. Who am I kidding? Maybe if I tilt his hand inward a little bit. It would work more ideally if his hand was tilted inward, so actually what I'm gonna do here. So I'm going to go a little crazy. I'm going to modify the angle that this arm attaches at. By removing some plastic. Not too much, just off of one side and just so that his hand tilts more in towards his body. something else if you're looking to cut styrene if you don't need it to be too pretty around the cut you can do worse than slathering on a little plastic glue and letting it set for a minute and then coming in to do the cut it will soften the styrene to a point where your blade will go right through it no problemo that's about uh, almost 8 p.m. where I'm at there we go. It'll rest nicely and it'll look like he's moving the arrow in to be drawn. Oh, go ahead. Drop that. Easiest way to do this is just a dab of glue at the two points where it needs to connect. Which is the inside of the hand there. outside of the bow there. Looks like he is knocking an arrow and getting ready to, to start drawing his bow. At least, you know, in theory. Now you can see because of the way I cut the arm, I have a little bit of a gap here at the back of the arm, and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to swipe a little plastic glue in there because it's going to fill that in nicely. Wipe off any excess. 2.45 in the morning, my god! My god, what are you doing up so late? Don't stay up on my account, man. And have him kind of... tilting his head to regard his potential target. Painting and building, painting and... Well, you know what? As long as you're being productive. As long as you're being productive, I've got no issue. I mean, I don't really have an issue either way. Just, you know. You're making things. That's something. Now we're going to do a hip quiver on this fellow. slung one, but there. Yeah, I want it to 
rotate this way because it would be attached to the belt. So the pivot point would be high. Oh, oh, Jamie, you caught me. You caught me slouching. we go. With a strung bow and everything. On to the next one. Put him over here very gently. I love it when a model can stand on its own without having to lean on anything. Since I've done my job right. Oh, let me fix that lumbar support. There we go. Okay. Dab of glue. This arm set is my least favorite. It's a little goofy and I almost always modify it. I have trouble figuring out what it is he's supposed to be doing. I guess... I guess he's meant to be reaching... The only thing I can figure is that this arm is meant to be always reaching back to draw an arrow. That's that's the only thing I can figure, because the other... Anything else, the angle doesn't make any damn sense. How's the new, chew, the new chair hunt going? You know, I went to Ikea, and I just... I didn't find any that I was in love with for the price, which is surprising for me at Ikea. I, I'm usually able to find something when I go there. So I'm I'm still making do with the old one. I, I haven't fallen in love yet, and for whatever reason, I need to fall in love before I replace this chair. It's a good chair. It's just getting a little worn. And the, the gas cylinder is not what it was. Um, so my, the problem with that Sumatha is the angle of it is such that if you attach it, like if you attach it here, the angle is such that the elbow is downturned, so it looks like he's reaching back like this. If you attach it here, like he's just released an arrow, the arm is up here. And this is an incredibly unnatural posture. If you have just released, you're more likely to have your elbow be in line with your shoulders. Um, and you can see that... Where's one where I did that? Like, this guy is in a posture more like just released an arrow. He looks like he just got done firing, and he sort of tilted the bow off to the side. I thought of that, though. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this one is meant to be reaching back for another arrow over the shoulder. So kind of necessitates the use of the back quiver to pose it properly. See, that looks reasonable enough. Just say that I'm 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 glad that Conquest that that Parabellum continues to improve the quality of their sculpts. <laughs> Got that that <laughs> he's like oh where'd my head go oh no I'd buy that 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 works for me. I don't use this button anywhere near enough. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. Just like a bit like he's scratching his head like an ape. 
<laughs> that's the. I'm glad you appreciate that Sumatha because that's the best part of that scene to me. Like I'd buy that for a dollar is, is sort of a funny meme by itself, but the best part of I'd buy that for a dollar is how everyone in the movie regards it like it is the funniest thing they have ever seen. Get the yelling head and say he's yawning. <laughs> When are we getting stuck in? Werner Herzog action figure. Oh man. Does does it come with a deep sense of ennui? With with an existential dread? It seems like it should. Is that everything I need to put on this guy? Yeah, I think so. Alright, there's number three. This process does take a little while, but I think it's I think it's worth it. And if I'm gonna spend as much time painting these minis as I'm inevitably going to, I'd like them to look the way I want, you know? Now this is the one that I almost that that I'll I'll usually do at least one or two of this arm in the drawn posture cuz this one is ideal for that. It either looks like he has literally just loosed an arrow, or you can do it as his bow is drawn. But I will do a few of them in the just loosed and then a few in the actively drawn. And the other thing you can do is you can have this one kind of low, like this. In that sort of like gangster draw posture that nobody ever actually does because it's ridiculous. But I prefer up here. Looks like he just volleyed at a shallow angle. No, Roland. Too soon, man. Too soon. I don't know what it is, but it's definitely too soon. No. No, Roland. It's, 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 it's way it's way too soon, Roland. Come on, man. Yes, Scud Twenty Four. The storm report remains open until we start it. Yeah, you see, this arm here, Sumatha. This is in a very very natural just released posture like you can see how the the fingers are kind of just lightly relaxed like this and the thumb is hanging up slightly and then the elbow is slightly relaxed and the bow is still in the firing pot yeah this is this is in the just released posture here a good proper one where you know you draw with your back and then release And will often wind up raising your hand as you do. Not a, not a lot, a few inches. We did that for a little bit, Scud24, but it was stupid, so we stopped. Yeah, it was just, it was confusing, is what it was. Confusion results in people not posting. Understandably so. This guy's got a little bit of that Kiati Mundi forehead going on. Look at that. Yikes. Pun expected. Raiding with a party of one. Isn't that just joining the chat? Unexpected welcome in, my friend. How are you doing? Thank you so much for getting that shout out, Don Data Nerd. Folks, if you're not following Pun Expected Painting, oh my, 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 are you in for a treat? Particularly if you enjoy oil painting, which if you've been hanging around here for the last few months, you might. 
you might. You might be sick of oil painting if you've been hanging around here for the last few months, but you also might enjoy it. And if you fall into the latter of those two, you definitely want to give Pun Expected a follow. What were you working on today, Pun Expected? Have you finished up the, the base for the Arizona Tea Titty Lady? Which I know that she has a name, that's just all I can think of to call her, I'm sorry. Hey, that's four done. Back to the sprues. Oh, good to see you, Arkrave. Toss some picks in a few. Finish up the Kingdom Death. Pin up Honeycomb Weaver. You started with Stila Rebel. Stila is a joy to paint with, is she not? Is it just me? I always have fun. We're going to be doing a little bit of that later this week. They're not my favorite clippers. I don't know where my favorite clippers are right now. Did you say what you're working on today, Jamie? I know you've got uh, apparently quite a lot built today. I know you're working on some space wolves, but what are you building today specifically? There's the quivers, some of the arms. I just mean, what uh, what models have you been working on today, specifically? Oh, that's no problem. Oh, I gathered there was uh, a little bit of a language disconnect, but uh, that'll... that'll... That'll happen. I don't mind asking for clarification. I only speak two languages, English and bad English. It's not actually true, but yeah, that's the only languages I speak well. How about that? Is that fair? It seems fair to me. Yes, 
The Fifth Element, also known as uh, one of the only truly great movies that Luc Besson has ever done. A lot of his other work is just kind of weird. Not that The Fifth Element isn't weird. It's very weird, but it's weird in a way that works. Four bodies, four quivers. Here we go, here we go. Where's the rest of them? One. Always keep a hand on the thing you're clipping out, lest it go flying across the room. Might seem like obvious advice, but I'm going to give it anyway. German, bad English, and a little bit of Japanese. A regular polyglot, huh? How long have you been, uh, building, painting figures, Jamie? I'm curious. Seems like you've done quite a lot of them. If you have that many completed forces, that's impressive, man. Quivers, two arms, four bows, four bodies, one head. I need two arms. One of them is here. Three and a half years. That is impressive work for three and a half years, man. You should be proud of yourself. There it is. I'm trying to find one of these heads that has a little bit less of that Kiati Mundi effect going on, huh? This gentleman's a little bit more reasonable. Let's go with him. Oh, it's cool you got somebody to do it with, too. And... Okay. Four, 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 four. That should be everything I need from this sprue. All set to clean up, folks. Give me one minute. I'm going to take a quick bio break. I will be right back to freshen up my beer. Yeah, I might as well do that as well. Stretch my legs for just a second. We'll get right back to it. We'll be starting the storm report in just about 25 minutes, at which point it'll be closing. Uh, remind people that you are allowed two standard entries tonight since we missed uh, Thursday's stream. So if you want to get out there and share your work with us, please get onto that Discord. Please post your work. Jamie, if you've got some pictures of your work, I'd love to see it, man. Uh, it's real easy to do. Hit exclamation Discord in the chat or click the Discord button that should be right down there. Hop into the Thunderhead Studio Discord and post in the channel marked The Storm Report up to two pictures of some of your work that you would like just to share. You want some feedback on? You're just particularly proud of it? It doesn't matter why. Uh, let me know. You know? Hey, I want some advice with this. Hey, I did this and it's cool. I would absolutely love to show your stuff live here on the stream. Anyway, I will be back in just a minute. So don't go anywhere, unless it's to get more candy, in which case, tonight of all nights, I understand. You know, go ahead. I'll see you in a sec.
Back to the old grindy grind. <clears throat> I realize, I realize, of course, that me uh, sitting here scraping away at peasant militia short bows is is probably not the most riveting content, but it's what I need to do tonight. So I appreciate y'all joining me for it. In any case, uh, definitely helps having a few people to share a laugh and maybe a complaint with. And, you know, a lot of people are, uh... A lot of people are out there Halloweening right now. After all, last year's Halloween was not the most impressive showing for anyone, so I'd imagine a lot of people are real eager to get out there and enjoy their night tonight. So for those of us who are at home, hanging out on Twitch, again, thank you all for joining me. Oh, that was that 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 was a stretch. That was a stretch to square. That's woo Yikes. What's going on with this bow? Why is this limb so much more flexed than the other one? Did I do that when I was removing it from the sprue? They're not all like that, are they? I just didn't notice? Or did I bend it? No, I must have bent it, because this one's more flexed than the other one. Must have done that by accident. When I bend these bow limbs, I tend to do it in boiling water, because doing it otherwise is inviting disaster, so right now I am inviting disaster, but I'm just trying to relax it. That's... better. How did I bend it so much? Must have bent it up close to the fulcrum. I'm just surprised that I managed to do that just removing it from the sprue. There, that's that's better. It's more even. And again, 
These are things that literally no one is ever, ever going to notice, but, uh... You know, some of these things we do for ourselves. What's up, Supernaut? How you doing, man? You know, the good news? Each and every box of militia comes with pieces to build both the, um... These guys, the, the, the Halberd Militia, and the Bowman Militia. So I've got extra sets of arms. So I, I, I can be a little... A little aggressive with them without feeling too... Too nervous. You know what's funny, Roland? That comment is literally all that it took for the thought to enter my head. I'd like to watch Star Wars Rebels again. And you know what? I would watch Star Wars Rebels again, but I'm pretty sure I owe a show watch to Sumitha right now. Because <laughs> he's been trying to get me to watch, like, two shows forever. And I, I had a moment recently where I was like, I'm going to start re-watching, and then I stopped, and I was like, no. 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 You're going to watch something new, damn it. Merlin Models, good to see you. How you doing today, man? I'm doing pretty damn good, all things considered. I am so glad to hear that, by the way. Hopefully everything works out. Yeah, Sumitha, like, at a certain point, I have to stop being a complete asshole. At a certain point. I'm glad you like it, Merlin Models. I'm hoping that when I get these painted, like... I, I don't know what I'm hoping for. Like, I'm, I'm trying to articulate that. Like, what am I hoping for? People will be like, hey man, good job. <laughs> that's, the, that's the best possible outcome. <laughs> uh, really, I just like the strung bows. I just think they look... I did all my crossbowmen, too. I've shown you guys the crossbowman that I did, right? This is this is sort of where I developed the technique a little bit more. I'll tell you what I am gonna do though is um drop a tile on the floor. Um I'll go ahead and release these broadhead arrows and crossbow bolts that I made to Thingiverse. If you have a resin printer, they're really, really easy to print. And they are just about the perfect length for these two figures. It's a hyper niche item that maybe one whole person will ever download, but I'll put it up for free. Aw, oh, thanks, Kursala. I'm actually doing okay. Thank you. You know what? Well articulated, Merlin Models. Those are all of my hopes and dreams. I always said you have to make your goals achievable. I think that's probably fairly achievable. Yeah, I do need to watch Pig. You are not wrong. I've heard good things about Pig. I've watched Mandy twice. I don't know how I haven't watched Pig. Mandy was a great fucking movie. Oh! 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 I wanted to talk about something, by the way, that I only just remembered. Is anybody here watching Wellington Paranormal? Can I just, can I just, you know, I, I know that this is really out of character for me, but can I just bitch about something popular for a second? I know, I know, you're thinking... Thunderhead's like a big Disney shill. He's not gonna complain about popular things. He consumes pop culture. He doesn't act like a contrarian and bitch about it. Um, I have not liked the latest season of what we do in the shadows. I am a huge fan of the movie What We Do in the Shadows. I fucking love that movie and I have for a long time. I watched that back when it first came out 
and I've seen it countless times since then. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, I was a little apprehensive when I saw that they were making a show based on what we do in the shadows, but I saw that the writing team attached um, was, you know, it had Jermaine Clements, uh, Taika Waititi was producing and was going to be in it, you know, briefly. I was like, yeah, this is, this is, okay. Okay. Sure. And I watched it, and it's, it's good. It's it's great fun. We're werewolves, not swearwolves. <laughs> oh, Iron Andy, I like you. That was Reese Darby. I, I love Reese Darby. He's funny, as long as he's performing other people's material. Um, but, yeah. So, I watched the show, and the show's good. It's good. For two seasons. And this latest third season... I, I don't want to say that the latest third season is bad. Because here's the thing. Comedy is hard to define. Comedy's hard to judge. Comedy is hard to critique. Because what one person finds hilarious and clever and brilliant, one person might find uh, puerile and, and, and juvenile, disgusting, and, and off-putting. It's, it, it's very possible. Iron Andy, thank you so, so much for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. But, you know, for my money, for my preferences... Um, oh, Supernaut, you haven't been paying attention, man. Fuck your, fuck your sinew and hemp. My bowstrings are much, much crisper. Much crisper. So, that being said, Jamie the Marine, thank you. I keep I'm actually slouching a lot tonight. Um, the latest season of What We Do in the Shadows, I, I, I don't want to get into this is bad, that's bad, I don't like what they've done with this character, because like I said, I feel like all that's subjective, so I'm just going to say the clearest critique I can give of what we do in the Shadows Season 3, I'm not laughing. I'm not laughing. I'm watching the show, and I'm not laughing. I'm just like, oh, yeah. Yeah. a couple chuckles. There was like the Atlantic City episode, and I was like, ha, 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 yeah, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> and then I was just back to not laughing. <sighs> Which started to make me sad, because I got to a point where, like, I saw a new episode of What We Do in the Shadows available on Hulu, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna... I'm gonna watch something else, you know? And that's a bad feeling, you know? Uh, losing that joy that you get out of a show. But all this is leading me to talk about something else. Oh, Supernaut, I'm using all... These are, um... When, when my 3D printer goes... The first thing that it does is it runs a single line of material on the edge of the plate, which is just to prime the extruder, and it makes these little strings. And I save them, and I clip them, and I make bowstrings out of them. All of my guys have 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 strung bows at this point. That's that's, that's what I'm doing tonight. Um. So to turn this into me talking about something positive. And a realization that I had, because I was like, why is what we do in the shadows not doing this for me? What I, I seek the reason. I'm not satisfied in just letting it go. I have to know what happened. And I looked into it, and Jermaine Clement left the writing team for what we do in the shadows at the end of season two. In order to, and this was the part that interested in me, focus on his other show, Wellington Paranormal, which I did not know existed. Wellington Paranormal is funny as fuck. Wellington Paranormal is is exact like it is tonally almost exactly like the movie What We Do in the Shadows. And it, it's amazing the difference that that can make. Like I, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that I can put my finger on, okay, this is what Jermaine Clement's doing that's working. But clearly he's the difference because he left the writing team and I almost immediately lost interest in the show. And I go over to another show that he's writing and I'm like, yep, this is it. This this is the humor. So I guess I'm a big Jermaine Clement fan. I guess that's just how it is. Uh, Wellington Paranormal, by the way, is set in the same universe as what we do in the shadows. It literally has several of the same characters. Um... Nick, the young vampire from what we do in the shadows, is a character who features in at least one episode of season one in Wellington Paranormal. Uh, the cops who we focus on in Wellington Paranormal, if you remember the scene in the movie What We Do in the Shadows when they get the cops called on them and they just glamour them into not seeing the blood or the corpses or anything around the house, it's those cops. And it's them going around, responding to paranormal cases. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Iron Andy. Yeah, no smoke detectors, that's, that's a fire hazard there. Oh, God, I, I love their delivery. 
And and what I think really works about the show is that um, they set them up as like a Mulder and Scully type. Oh, oh, apparently I'm drinking. Apparently I'm drinking. All right, let's do that. Well, I cleaned up those four bows. You know what? We got a, a good amount of building tonight because these guys take a while to make. <sighs> and I'm glad I got this many of them done. I am I am that much closer to being done with them. Here, by the way, is uh, here are a couple of... Well, you know what? I'll put them on a stand so I can actually show them. I'll show you the one assembled group of Militia Bowmen so you know what I'm going for here. Oh no, these are the old bases! You see how I just made an asshole of myself? Oh, that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. I gotta put them on the new bases. Alright, I'll just show them the old-fashioned way. Alright, I'm on it. I'm on it, Data Nerd. I'm just saying. Oh, now I gotta focus my camera. I'm so good at this! I'm so good at the streaming. This is, this is what they look like when I'm done stringing the bows and adding in the uh, arrows where necessary. I think it's worth it. They look pretty decent. We'll get some paint on these guys in the coming weeks. But, okay, I got distracted. Um, all I'm trying to say is, I'll put it as simply as possible. If you watched the movie, What We Do in the Shadows, and you thought, this is great, uh, go watch Wellington Paranormal, because it's fucking hilarious. I've only watched the first season so far, which is only six episodes. Um, but I am thoroughly enjoying it. And I think what really works about it is, again, they paint them as kind of like the Mulder and Scully going out and responding to, um, you know, paranormal law enforcement events. But they don't do anything. <laughs> like, they, they have, in no single episode, have they succeeded in solving the paranormal case. They almost always get tied up in their own bullshit bureaucracy and and wind up, like, letting the monster off in some way. Or or they try to arrest a ghost and the ghost sits in the back of the cruiser for a minute and then while they're talking to the camera, you just see the ghost kind of get up and walk out of the car because he's a fucking ghost. And it's like, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's... I have Iron Andy. I don't get Hunt for the Wilder people mentioned to me very much, but I love that movie. That's some good Sam Neill action there. That's the first place I saw that kid who wound up being in Deadpool 2. You played, what do they call him in Deadpool 2? Fire Fist, or whatever he was. Yeah, I like Hunt for the Wilder People quite a lot. An interesting combination of drama and comedy in that one. Very interesting. Oh, yeah, no, this is, this is, this is hydration. Super not. What do you think all this wet stuff in here is? Ah, free guy. Taika Waititi is a super villain. I'm about to check that out, Roland. Uh, Scud24, it is on... I think I have access to it on HBO Max. I think that's where I'm watching it. I'm not sure where else it might be available. I know it's on HBO Max. Yeah, because right now on HBO Max I'm watching Doom Patrol and, um, and, and Wellington Paranormal. It's... <laughs> Iron Andy, if, uh, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't watched Wellington Paranormal... Based on the jokes you're pulling out that you enjoy, and, and like, go watch it. Go watch it. Jamie, what do I think about what? I'm happy to, happy to let you know what I think. Wonderful. Have I been watching Inside Job on Netflix? I've never even heard of Inside Job on Netflix. What is that? Oh, 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 okay. Your brother asked you about a challenge. Can you build and paint and start collecting Tyranids in four hours? I'm going to say yes. I think Tyranids are pretty easy builds. Relatively speaking, as long as you don't get really, really bogged down and what you see is what you get. Because I feel like Tyranids have a lot of gray area when it comes to what piece represents what mutation. And I feel like each modeler kind of decides for themselves, like, oh, this is going to be a Venom Sack, when it could be a number of different things. So as long as you don't get, or as long as you have a plan, and you don't get too bogged down in, um, in how you're building it, you can build it quick, and then they have all organic textured shapes, so exactly as Vergaderung says, dry brush, dry brush, dry brush. You can dry brush a good-looking set of Tyranids, like, in no time flat. Let's start collecting boxes, what? 20 models? How many models is it? I'm going to guess there's a good number of Termagants and or Hormagants. 10... 12, maybe. Maybe a couple of Warriors. 
Is there a Carnifex in the start collecting box? I can't remember. But, uh, yeah, I think as long as you have a plan for your construction and you're okay with dry brushing and washing, I think you could do that. I, I, I believe that that is possible. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't really had much Shiner since I left Texas, but, uh... <sighs> I enjoy it every now and then. Mother bottle, bottle of Sam Adam Utopia, 240 bottle. Oh, fuck, what the fuck? What? Really, just 10 minis? Oh, fuck yeah. Jamie, you got this, man. Bet him a lot of money and then completely kick the challenge's ass. Unless he's listening to what I'm saying right now. In which case, I've ruined your plan and I'm sorry. It fucking better be... That shit for $240? That shit had better be like 98% alcohol by volume, and I'll be diluting it into drinks <laughs> for the next year. <laughs> Holy Christ, man. Imagine an adult animated series a la Rick and Morty or Final Space where the main characters are Shadow Government or Deep State. Pretty much all conspiracies are real, but they struggle to keep track of which things. So it's got like a little bit of the American Dad flavor to it, because that was kind of what they were going for with that one. Which, I enjoyed American Dad for a few seasons, but it eventually got, like, really self-referential. That, that always kind of happens, though. Ah, alright. It's about time for the Storm Report, folks. So why don't we do that? Let me get it pulled up on my end. I think the other thing you can do with Tyranids, depending on the models... A lot of the Tyranid models, they have, like, their back plate, their carapace, is a separate piece, Jamie. And this is one of the few cases where I would say maybe, um, uh, sub-assembly painting is a good idea. Because most paint schemes for Tyranids, you want to do the soft tissue and the lower carapace in, in one color, and then the hard tissue and the upper carapace in another. So if you dry brush the lower parts separately from the upper parts do them in two distinct and clashing colors, and then glue the upper carapace down when you're done, you can get a really nice division of color and have it be really, really easy to paint. I, you know what? If you've never done it, particularly if you've never done it, and you've done as many armies as you have, you'll like Tyranids. They're very different from Orc Space Marines. Like, you said you did a bunch of Space Wolves. I think you'll like doing Tyranids. It's a nice break. My Tyranids don't have Venom Sacks, just dozens of Scrotums. <sighs> yep. Yep. Uh-huh. <sighs> you know what Merlin models? I have very, like, look, you can see, I don't have much beer left in here. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to drink this. I'm going to get another beer, and then we're going to start the storm report. So you've got just a couple minutes. I'll allow it. Mods, I'll allow one from Merlin Models, as long as he gets it in before I get back with my beer. That's my requirement. Ah, for what it's worth, I believe in you. So, yeah. I'm pretty sure these guys are going to be hitting the paint desk on Tuesday. And I'm kind of excited about it. Because I kind of love these models. They're huge and they're chunky and they're they're they, they have a lot of fun details on them. And this banner, I, I I genuinely cannot describe to you how fucking nonsense this banner is. It's huge and it has so much detail on it. I'm looking forward to digging in on this. The only thing that sucks about the, the Household Knights is that I keep stabbing myself on their lances. Because they're really quite long and, and really very pointy. Oh, that's what she said. Oh, no, that's a terrible joke. Inquisitor Burnsy, how you doing today, man? Oh, TWS. Oh, oh, you beat me to it. I just didn't even realize it. You know what? I read that, Burnsy, and I thought it was an onomatopoeia. I thought you were going... Tss, tss. I don't know why, but that's what my brain did. I went... Tss. And then I thought about it, I'm like, oh, that's what she's... Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Fair enough. Uh, 
You know, Kursala, it's a fucking great idea. I should have a drink fridge in here. Next time we do a donation goal, that's what it's going to be for. Get Thunderhead a drink fridge to go under his desk. I'll be right back. And I'm back and I've got another beer. Hang on, let me, let me just brush some of this plastic dust off my desk because otherwise this is going to wind up getting ground into my elbow in a second and I'm going I'll, to... I'll be, I'll be mildly irritated by it. That's unacceptable. Data Nerd, why do I never listen to you? Months ago you were like, you need to get yourself one of those little vacuums for your desk. I'm like, yeah, what, whatever, whatever, nerd. You're absolutely fucking correct, and I'm sorry. You know, no, no specific plans right now, Roland, but I haven't let go of that yet. I have not let go of that yet. I just, uh... I need to get some things out of Chaotic Harmony before we can get back in, and I need to put together about at least two fresh party members. Because I've actually got a fairly well-developed story for launching back into Cyberpunk Red, and with the Cyberpunk Combat Zone minis coming out soon, I'd definitely like to get some going, because I think we could do some, some fun mini build and paints. One day I might learn, but I probably won't. Alright, let me get this pulled up over on my end. Zip back up to the top. Move that window there, and let's have a look, shall we? All right, locusts and gentle mechs, get ready to feast your eyes on glor and wet palettes with the occasional culinary oh, atrocity no. thrown in on tonight's storm report. Brought to you by viewers like you. Ah! <laughs> uh. I rolled the wheel of my chair over my air hose for my airbrush, and that was dumb. <sighs> I drank for the shame of not getting the desk. <laughs> I was, I was, I was gonna drink anyway. Let, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, that was a. Uh, that was doing a dumb. Let's see what folks are sharing today. Here we have from Rockin' Robin Workshop. Here's Manbat. Ooh, that's actually pretty nice. Got a real soft reddish brown for the bat fur, and I, I'm, I'm actually really digging that. I feel like you could go crazy with this mini, and I don't know that you should. Usually, like, this reminds me of the animated man bat. This, this reminds me of the man bat from the animated series. Not necessarily the shape of him or the ears, because he had much more of a stylized, pointy-eared shape to him. But the color palette is very much like Man Bat from the animated series. Jamie. Like, again, I don't, I don't think the design is inspired by TAS, but 
the color palette you did here is is very much TAS to me with the green pants and everything. Yeah, the rock looks nice. And this is, in my opinion, this is another, I, I like to point these out when I find them. This is a good example of temperature contrast and color composition, okay? I say this because what do we have? The two primary colors on this mini are warm brown and cool gray. And they're occupying positions here where it's primarily the lower half is a triangle of cool gray. It's, it's a... Convex. Oh my god, my brain just forgot which one is convex and which one is concave, but then I remembered. Um, it's, it's sort of a convex shape overall, and then there's a concave shape to Manbat with his wings. So we have cool gray in this little triangle, and then more of a circular shape. We have the warm brown. It's very pleasing to the eye, what you've done here, Rock and Robin. And well, here's the thing, and, and I know that, I know that, Robin. You don't have to do it on purpose to do a good job at it. And one of the reasons I mention it is because I want to point it out to you that whether you meant to do it or not, it works on a level that you might not have intended. It's, it's simple, it's effective, and it's very pleasing to the eye. And exactly as Sumitha said, uh, we, have, we have this little splash of green right here in the middle, which is just kind of separating the two and keeping them visually distinct. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. As Supernaut said, Pooh Brown, that's that's really, you're, you're, it's, it's, it's a, a, a valid and, 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 and valuable uh, contribution to the discussion. I, I really I appreciate that insight. This is a skill that I value, too, Wildstar. It's, um, yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right, Rock and Robin. If you had done blue jeans... They would have been... The, 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 the blue, the cool color would have been way too dominant across the whole mini. With the green here, and this is another example of composition, because we have here, here, and here. We have this lovely triangle of green. One, two, three. Pleasing, simple shapes. Tricking the human mind into liking what it's seeing. Rack and Robin, you are... I feel comfortable giving you compliments like this because I, I know you and I know that you're gonna take this in the right spirit. You have a a very casual quality to your painting that works incredibly well. You don't, it, it seems to me, I'm saying this is from an external point of view, Rock and Robin doesn't overthink his paint jobs. And there's such a thing as overthinking your paint jobs. There really is. Could you do more complex than work than this? Absolutely you could. Absolutely you could. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you should. This is simple. It's effective. It, it uses uh, real, real basic techniques in a way that is just incredibly pleasing to the eye and makes the best use of the features that are on the model itself. Also, this is a cool fucking model. This is, this is a really nice man bat. I like how they built it with his wings hanging down the way that they do. Could have done membrane wings. That was actually my first thought was, yeah, you could you could do the pinks and like come in and sort of hand do the veins and everything like that and the membranes and the wings. But I'm like, you know, it's, it's not really necessary. And like I said, this reminds me a lot of how he was colored in the animated series. And and maybe this is nostalgia working its way in, but I, I like it. I like it a lot. Rock and Robin. This is some some fantastic work as always. I love all your DC stuff, man, and thank you for sharing this with us. Oh, here we have from Mafik, the best tag name ever in the world of tanks blitz. Oh wait, what is it? Frick Doc and my nuts. 100,000 kilograms painful. What? <laughs> what? The fuck are you talking about, Mafik? You're gonna have to help me with this one, man. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> the fucking world of tanks. 
Oh my god. Here we have from Roland. Looks like we're looking at a Marauder. Why do I have, I have a little schmutz on my screen? I was like, is that in the picture? No, that's on my screen. Oh, it, oh my god. Is this a math joke? And he drives 180 ton tanks? Oh. <laughs> oh, nice looking Marauder, though. Your paintwork's getting cleaner, Roland. I still think, like, as far as things for you to work on, I, I, I'm still going to keep pushing. Contrast and highlights, I think, are, are of the paintwork that you're doing. It's your weakest element so far. you got to learn to embrace that contrast, those deep shadows, so that the details can pop out more. I will say this is one of the best photos you've ever taken of a mini. I can see everything on it, and I fucking love it. Please do more of these. Your, your brushwork has gotten a lot cleaner. If that's what you've been focusing on, congratulations. Because this is working. The light box is a huge improvement, Roland. Please keep using this. Because it also makes giving critique so much easier. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man. Why pants at all, though? No, Man Bat doesn't... No. Look, Man Bat is a long-established character in the DC Universe Supernaut, and Man Bat does not hang dog. We've been over this. At least once. Haven't we? I don't know, probably. This is... this is clean. I think that... Yeah. Your brushwork... And the smoothness of your layers have shown major improvement. And Roland, I want you to really take some models to just practice on and focus on getting the deep shadows and the high highlights. I know you've been doing a lot of dry brushing. I'd say really start to diverge that contrast between your dry brush color and your base color. Do it more and more. Push it past the point that you think it looks good. Push it to an absolute extreme and... See if it doesn't work. Because if you push that contrast, if you push those highlights, and you keep your brushwork nice and clean, and you keep up the good color choices, you're going to have some pretty fantastic paint jobs in the near future, man. Thank you for sharing with us. Here we have from Wheezy. Failed my piloting skill check. I saw this on Instagram and it made me sad. Failing my, failed my piloting skill check, but our top mech techs are able to put the commander's ride back together for the most part anyway. Might be able to do that antenna, but I couldn't find the missing piece. So this actually gave me a thought. I mentioned it on Instagram. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to keep releasing these on Thingiverse, first of all. Just because... There are way too many fucking Etsy sellers who are selling these mechs right now. Like, I, I, I find a new one every week, and... I... I don't know, for a while I felt like I didn't care, but then as time goes on, it turns out I do. I just don't like the idea of these guys out there making money on these designs. Um, I don't know if I don't like the idea of them making money on these designs because I made them and I should make money, or if I don't like them making money on these designs because none of us designed them and none of us should be making money. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly. I, I can't fully articulate my feelings on it because they're just kind of reactive. But I know that I don't like it. I love people being able to print these out for themselves. I don't like the Etsy sellers. Now, even though they're good for visibility, I guess? Like... No. Oh. But, the reason I mention this is because this got me to thinking about how I could take that antenna piece on top of the Battlemaster's head, and I could make that a separate piece, and then have a slot on the top of the cockpit so that you can print out the antenna piece separately, carefully, and then glue it in. And then if it breaks, you could pop it out and you could put another one in without, without too much difficulty for sort of a version 2 of these mechs. The other thing that I kind of want to do with these mechs is go back to them and implement the multi-pose joint system that we did for the uh, trench foot. These, This may happen in the spring. This may happen in the spring. There may be a version 2 of these Dugram mechs out there. I was so sad to see that this guy exploded, but I am glad to see this Battlemaster getting put back together. This is one of my favorite mech designs, and if I may toot my own horn for a moment, 
I fucking love this sculpt. I love how beefy it is. I like I like the proportions on it. I like how chunky the torso is. I like how big the cockpit is. I like the shape that I got to the bubble. Uh, I still haven't seen anybody print out the ones with the open cockpits, but you know I'm still glad I did the project. It was good practice. Re-D seen them. I like the way you think, Vergadero. I like the way you talk. Yeah, yeah, that's it, Sumitha. It's like a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, it just leaves me in the position of I don't, I don't fucking like these guys out there selling the shit. <sighs> Unapologetic Dong Studios. You know what? That's actually not a bad name for a studio. Like, you're kidding? But I would probably buy from those guys. First point is basically I've only done original stuff and not fan art stuff. Yeah, and you know, MCC, these mechs in particular that I designed, um, I say designed. I, I did the 3D modeling. This is not my design. This is Kunio Okawara. He designed this. Um, it was practice. You know, and that's that's kind of why I'm, I'm, I'm middling on whether I'm going to do anything about it or not. It, it's it's These were practice. These were me learning how to make files like this and how to keep them nice and clean and... Uh, also a passion project because I love the source work. Yeah, it, is, it definitely is fan art, though. Well, I'm glad you got that back together, Wheezy. Here we have from Forgotterung. Woo! Finally! I finished up 25 Comguard Max all done in one month! Plus, my freehand has improved, I think. White is dry brushed up from black through three grays to titanium white with a makeup brush. Numbers and logos are freehand! That was my best Forgotterung yet. That was, ooh, that was, that was good. That was really good. That was spot on. For those of you who've been in voice chat with Vergata Wrong, that's, that's, that's exactly what he sounds like. Exactly what he sounds like. Let's take a look at these Comguard mechs. He's really hard, fucking great looking. Oh man, with the dirt on the legs. And the, like, icy blue grass? Mmm. I think, like, this is the funny thing. I think the icy blue grass is maybe my least favorite thing on these models, and it still looks amazing. Like, I, I just, I feel like a different color could have been used to make it pop a little bit more, maybe, but that's like, this is me looking for something to have a problem with, because the ultimate truth is that these just look fucking phenomenal. It's such a crisp, lovely white. I like that kind of maroon, pinkish red that we have for the cockpit glass. I love the dirt on the legs. I just, I mean, I'm, I, I'm looking for things right now, Vergata I'm looking at this and I'm thinking like, I've got to say something about these minis. I've got to, I've got to critique them. I've got to pick out something where I'm like, you could do this better. Like, I've got to do something because that's what I do, goddammit. That's what I do. This is my bit on my stream and this is what I do, Vergata Rung, and you've made it like fucking impossible for me. This is so frustrating. <sighs> you know what? That's what you get. That's what you get, Vergadarung, and I hope you're happy. This is a fucking great great looking group of Comguard Max man. Really nicely done. I love how you've mixed in some of your alien flora and that little uh, acid river there in the middle. Uh, you know, for comedic effect, yes, White Wolf. Oh my god. Alright. Let's keep going. We can't dwell on this all day. God damn, really? Just, mmm. <sighs> Here's the thing for God wrong. You know why this hurts me so much? Is because up until this moment, my com guard that I did like a year and a half ago were my favorite com guard that I'd seen. Mine were my favorite for Gatarung. You've taken that from me.
Damn it. Damn it. Let's see what else we've got. Here is from Squared. Incremental progress. Go. Progress is progress. Slow or not. These Somerset Strikers are definitely coming together. Looks like we had a little bit of metal work going down over the red. I'm sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze for a second and I really just didn't want to do it right into my microphone. <coughs> Excuse me. I like the basing work we've got going on here too. It's, it's, it's simple. But simple kind of works for this. Particularly since we're, like, this is a good example of, like, an environment that this camo scheme can actually work in, but the camo scheme itself has enough dark colors added in, enough contrast, particularly on the legs where you've dirtied it up, that it doesn't become a visual mess. This is fairly clean. I like it. The little splashes of red do a whole lot for the Somerset Strikers. What, uh, someone remind me what the color of the cockpit glass was for the Somerset Strikers? Because I can't remember. Information is ammunition. Oh, man. I have a really badly ripped version of that show on some DVDs around here somewhere. <laughs> this thing's super not. I like how you add in there at the end, like, I don't care if that's how they were. Which, that is. Comguard mechs are white. That's the whole deal. <laughs> you dumbass. <laughs> Uh, I like this Bushwhacker figure. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not usually one for the Bushwhacker, but I think in the context of the Somerset Strikers, it just it it sets off that nostalgia for me. You know, same thing with the Axemen. They're the I guess this is the Hatchetman. This would be a Hatchetman, right? Because the Axemen has the second pod on the other shoulder. Or, or am I mixing them up? The Axemen had an auto cannon. Okay. Is, does the Hatchetman have the two launchers, the one on each shoulder? Oh no, it's just another Axeman. Ah, uh, never mind. I'm fucking stupid. Ignore me. I've just spent the last two years talking about how I love Inner Sphere mechs and I love melee, and I can't tell an Axeman from a Hatchetman. So pardon me while I be a huge fraud. <sighs> it's been a long day. Loving the look of the Somerset Strikers, man. Keep up the good work and incremental progress is still progress. Here we have... From Kursala. Finished. Repainted the wall Tuesday night towards the end of the stream, then remounted the gutters yesterday and today. Now, we wait. Now, this is, this is a feed system, right? Why does it look so much like a Rube Goldberg machine? I think that's it, Sumatha. I'm just used to different standard variants. Why does it look so much like some sort of Rube Goldberg machine? What is the... How does it... It's for growing fodder. Okay, 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 okay. This is, this is not for feeding. This is for growing fod. That makes infinitely more sense because, yeah, they're going to be growing a lot up in here and you can water it at the top and that's going to go down along and infiltrate each and... Okay, okay, that, 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 that simple change makes so much sense. I was just thinking, like, first of all, this is a weird place to feed. And secondly, what? <laughs> okay, I gotcha. I gotcha, Kursala. Really nice work on that. It looks so on purpose and so professional, it's kind of crazy. Here we have from Phaedro, still work in progress, but I was dissatisfied with my B1's look with just contrast paint. So I hit them with dry brush of Wraithbone and a light wash of Sarah from Sepia. They look battle ready now, save for the blaster. Phaedros, I'd like to say something. You mentioned something about contrast paint that I, I, I think is one of the reasons I like contrast paint as much as I do. Contrast paint is super duper easy to use. First of all, Nice job on these. They're definitely a little crisper. We saw some of yours before. Um, contrast paint is is, is a, such an amazingly great place for people to start because it's so easy to do. 
but it's also this perfect point of divergence because you're going to start off with contrast and you're going to put it on a model and you're going to have one of two reactions, generally speaking, which is, this is good enough, I painted my army, this is fucking awesome, or I want to do more. You're going to have one of these two reactions, and, and the people who before would have been in the, this is good enough, I'm happy camp, those people were fucking shit out of luck for the most part. Not entirely. They could have learned some things and gotten some effects very similar to contrast paint using existing products. They could have, but it would have taken more work. So for them, it's a fucking godsend. But for everybody else who, who enjoys painting more, who, who wants a higher standard, who enjoys the process, they can also get started and then go, you know, I can do better. I can do more. I can see the next step that I'm going to take. And Phaedros, I'm fucking excited that you're in that camp, man. I am excited. Because I feel like we're going to see a lot more from you, and I always love knowing that. Princess Trunks, welcome. Welcome to the chat. How you doing? Or you can thin them down, use them as washes or inks. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, ultimately, White Wolf, if you get familiar enough with consistency and flow, you can turn any paint into almost anything, to be fair. Contrast, it, it's a good system. It's a good system. What's funny is I was doing something similar to it before they released it, but they didn't pay me any money. I wonder why that is. Obviously, I invented it. I mean, uh, come on. How, how could I not have? It's not like it was a really common technique that was being used by painters for, like, decades before that. That's crazy. That, that, that's ridiculous. No, obviously, I invented it. That's one of the ways that you can push it, Kursala. Absolutely. Um, that's very similar to value sketching. Um, more another word you could associate that with is filtering and or glazing. But yeah, like if you have an airbrush and you can give yourself like a zenithal highlight followed by a white dry brush followed by contrast, you can get some really good... Here's the thing though, if people are doing that, these days I recommend they try oil paints. Because if you do that with acrylics, if you do a zenithal prime and uh, a dry brush, and then, as as Mr. J is saying, contrast paints or, or glazes over top of it, you can get some decent results. If you do exactly the same thing with oil paint instead, it's going to be just that much more vibrant. It's, um... It's shockingly effective. Shockingly effective. Because that's the one problem with doing it with acrylics, is they can wind up a little washed out. A little washed out. You don't have that problem with wells. Well, I'd say the B1 is looking nice for digging into some of these techniques for the first time. You're definitely getting better contrast, ironically, for moving up from contrast paint, Phaedros. But uh, I'd love to see some more of your B1s, man. Get a whole squad of them together and, and let's see them. Keep, keep pushing that envelope, man. Also, uh, I can give you some tips if you're interested for doing really, really simple, particularly Star Wars blasters. A good way to do it, I have found... Paint, paint it first before you paint the rest of the droid. For Star Wars blasters, for anything you want that dark, metallic look to, paint it with a really, really dark gray. Um, not, like... I would say, you know, you got, like, white gray, mid gray, dark gray, black. Go to dark gray. Paint it dark gray. Dry brush it very lightly silver so the silver is only on the highest points and then black wash it. It is an insanely simple technique to get a good-looking, dirty black metal. Uh, give that a try in your Star Wars blasters. That's what I did for all of mine, and I found it worked shockingly well, and then it adds in that little bit of extra punch to paint jobs like this. Phaedros, lovely work on this, man. Please. Please share more. Yeah, no, I think that that worked well. Like you said, battle ready now, save for the blaster. Try that technique that I was just talking about, Phaedros. Dark gray. Silver dry brush, black wash. Try it a few times, refine it, season to taste. I think you'll like it. Here we have from NB Toby. I haven't used my resin printer for seven months to the day. I even left some water washable resin in there the whole time. Just stirred it, started it up, loaded up a file, and now have 80 tiny infantry. Yeah, you know, I found that too. I can really just leave resin in there for an extended period of time, and bizarrely it works. Am I? Have I been drinking too much? I'm just flailing my hand around and knocking shit off my desk. Oh my god. Uh, excuse the blurriness, as they are still wet. Yeah, it can be a little hard to tell. Look at the little, look at them. They're adorable. Oh my god. 
yes, uh, Wildstar, you're absolutely correct. You want almost no silver left on the... This is the one time that I'm going to recommend the Games Workshop slash Citadel product. Necron Compound. Necron Compound. That shit is fucking magic. Like... Uh, for silver dry brushing, there is legitimately nothing better on the planet Earth that I have found. Uh, it is it is the best of their dry brush compounds. I like the Citadel dry brush compounds, and of them, Necron compound is the best of them. You can use it for so many different things. It's it's kind of crazy. Look at all these little mans. Look at them. God damn, I love resin printing you guys. I just love it. Well, I'm glad to hear we're able to fire it up and get it rolling and not waste any money on Toby. Here we have, again from Square, this first Somerset Strikers are ready to roll. And we worked in... Oh, okay, here we got the cockpit glass actually getting painted, and I like it. And we've worked in that, uh, that Ion Raptor Rakshasa with all of its janky glory. Really, really nicely done. Surprisingly kind of punchy, poppy paint job. For the camo, I love the extra highlights, the edge highlights that you've done. It looks like maybe dry brushing, just to pick up some of these. Like this is this. Is... Don't get me wrong, I've, I've seen a number of your paint jobs. This is, I, you know, I just want to. If I can just say, this is this is honestly part of the challenge that I face doing a bit here where I critique people's paint jobs. Is I wind up saying things like, "This is so much better than your previous work," and I feel every time like it sounds like I'm saying the work you did before sucked, but it's not what I'm saying <laughs> at all. It's just it's amazing to watch the progress. It's amazing to watch people improve. There are so many wonderful small highlights on here. Simple techniques, not overly complex, not techniques you necessarily spent a whole lot of time on, but just simple choices that you made that punch up the paint job so much. The highlights on the Axemen are phenomenal. I am able to see the entire model, and that is always such a challenge on things like this. It does. That is what it means. Do weird things for blasters. Do the same thing you're talking about, but I use a silver sharpie, color a small acrylic rod with it, and run it over the edges. That that sounds like what I said with extra steps, Wildstar. <laughs> hey, you know what? There's no wrong way. There's no wrong way to do an art. There's the way that works for you, man. This is... These look good. These look real good. Are there things you could improve on? Yes. But having seen your work before and seeing these now, I don't want to I don't want to point any of them out because these are good paint jobs. And I think that this is one of those moments, those threshold moments where you should just take a second and be proud of what you've done. You can you can worry about improvement later. You should just take a second and be proud of what you've done. These look really nice. Fantastic work. Fantastic work, Squared, and thank you for sharing. The grungiest boys. Yeah, no, the weathering works really well. I was going to say, the weathering, like, right here on the leg of the Rakshasa, that's fucking great. Um, I think that if I was going to pick out one thing, to say, bad, bad, Squared, the weathering on the legs of the Warhammer is a little too heavy compared to the weathering that we have on the uh, Bushwhacker and the Axeman. Like, this is perfect. It's a little too much. It's a subtle difference. It's a very subtle difference. Oh shit, yeah, are we doing a year-end review? We did that last year, didn't we? Can anyone remember? Was anyone in the chat last year? Did we do a year-end review? I think we might do that again. Oh god, I'm gonna have to face the fact that I haven't painted shit this year. Here we have from Rockin' Robin Workshop, yet again, one, the one and unknowable Phil Cobb, aka Signal Man, with the only reputation of trapping Batman inside his own bat signal, and that's, uh... That's about it. Yeah, that was that was kind of the whole point, wasn't it? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I love your DC paint jobs so much, Robin. I, I... <laughs> my favorite DC paint jobs that Rock and Robin has done are the sillier ones like Kite Man, Polka Dot Man, the Condiment King. Um I think Signal Man is going to get rolled right up in there for one simple reason. And that's the green belt and the stripy boxers. <laughs> this is fucking magnificent. 
Oh, I love it. I love it. I love the really kind of subtle highlight metal work that we've done here. And I like the weathering on the bat signal. This is this is nice. This is very nice. Good job on the yellow, too. Yellow's a really tricky color to do, but this has come out pretty rich and pretty vibrant. Um, I think you could do more. I think you could do more on the yellow. But I feel like I can say that about almost every yellow paint job because it's one of the most challenging colors to do. It really, really is. Um, Rock and Robin, have you watched Goobertown Hobby's video on undershading yellow? If you haven't, I strongly recommend it. Brent goes into a lot of detail on color interactions with yellow and how to undershade it to get a real richness out of it that uh, I found very educational. And every now and then, I succeed at actually applying it, though not very often. Um, go check it out. Definitely, definitely go check it out, Rockin' Robin. Uh, Goobertown Hobbies on YouTube. If you just look up, uh, I think, Undershading Yellow, you're going to find the video. He uses magenta and pink to undershade his yellow, and it works shockingly well. Shockingly well. Lovely work on Signal Man. Here we have from Amateur Paint Hour. No explanation needed. This isn't real. This can't be real. This isn't the, this is, no, no, this is no, this isn't a thing. This is one of those horrible things that the internet does. Okay. Thank you, Data Nerd. Thank you for confirming that for me because this is really upsetting. It's, it's when you get to the black licorice that it starts to fall apart. Because, uh, no. <laughs> Please, God, no. What? No. Holy crap. The thing is, people do this shit for Halloween. Burger King released, like, a Whopper with a black bun that makes you shit green for, like, a week. People do this stuff, so you see it, and you're like, ah, did they really do it? See, that's, that's, I agree with you, forgot or wrong, but that would have to be so subtle. And it wouldn't be black licorice, it would be a niece. It would be a tiny bit of it. And, yeah, I mean, yeah, because you, you use that in some pork dishes, but, man, you've got to just barely use any, because that shit is potent. That shit is potent. Nano tanks. thank you so, so much for that prime sub, man. 18 months. 18 months. These, these numbers are just going to keep going up. God, what am I doing with my life? This is crazy. McDonald's and the Green Patties Day Milkshack. Yeah, the Shamrock Shades, man. Hell yeah. The best example of companies doing... See, I, I agree with you, Mr. J. The best example because the Shamrock Shakes didn't suck. They were they were not the worst. Yeah, I, I know, Data Nerd. It just it still makes me apprehensive. Almost can see this happening in Japan, so then they do multiple flavors of, well, everything. Well, yeah, okay, Sumatha, but it wouldn't be black licorice flavored. It would be squid ink flavored. And there's a difference. Jamie the Marine, thank you so much for hanging out tonight. Dude, I hope you had fun. It's been great having you in chat. You have a have a fantastic... Get some sleep, man. For God's sake. It's like fucking 4 a.m. or something. Get some sleep and then go build a whole fucking box of Tyranids. I'm looking forward to seeing it, man. <laughs> have a good night, bro. Will those really be any worse than candy corn? Uh, yes. Yes, Super Not. Yes, that would be worse than candy corn. What? Uh, 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 yes. For the love of God, yes. Uh, I've had a lot of beers tonight. People keep making me drink. My chat's abusing me. Oh, God, here we have from Darkheart. Ooh, it's exciting to see something from you, man. Final pick of the test palette for my Banshees. Let's have a look. Ooh. Ethereal. I love the little splash of yellow. That's a nice touch. If it was all blue, that would be quite a lot. That would be, that'd be quite a lot of blue. You'd lose a lot of the detail. A little splash of yellow in there definitely adds some interest here and there. Yeah, uh, this is a good choice of background for the photo. You are not wrong. I mean, technically, Supernat, almost anything is toxic in large enough doses. Water's toxic in large enough doses. 
<sighs> yeah, that'd be way worse than candy corn. Candy corn isn't, like, offensive. Candy corn is just disappointing. Candy corn doesn't make me go, oh, this is disgusting, get it out of my mouth. Candy corn makes me go, oh, oh, why did I eat this? If I have, like, literally nothing else to eat, I'll probably chew on a few pieces of it and just hate myself. But other than that, that's a really, this is, uh, I'm sorry, I thought there was another picture of this. This is, uh, this is a solid color palette. I like all the warmth you've used on the base, too. Darkheart X9, really nice. Darkheart has gotten started painting fairly recently, too. And honestly, has advanced incredibly quickly. Incredibly quickly. Very nice work on this. I can't wait to see a whole unit of those done up, Darkheart. I think that's a great choice. Here we have from White Wolf Setup Sunday. Where the hell am I putting all these runners edition? That's a good question. Got everything sorted out. Realized only half of the runners will fit into my holders. Then went away for just a few minutes to grab a snack. And now there's this little bugger. Napping smugly on my desk. Almost like he's trying to jump the line or something. And yeah, there might be something about me liking Eevee. It's a rather versatile Pokemon. After all. Oh, look at him. Oh, oh Eevee. Oh, he's going to evolve into one of three things. Wait. Does Eevee still evolve into only three things, or did they add a bunch of bullshit? They probably added a bunch of crap. I don't know. I haven't been I haven't been down with Pokemon since like Yellow Edition, and that was like 20 years ago. <laughs> oh god, I'm old. It's hard. It's hard being an old nerd. The world just doesn't understand. Eevee evolves into like 10 different ones. See, I knew it. I knew it. I didn't know specifically, but. I knew on some level that they had to have kept adding things. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, of course they added a bunch of bullshit. Just as cynical as I am, MCC. I'm glad to see it. I need a new... Ooh, actually. I'm glad I saw this, because that just reminded me. I need to order a new thing of uh, Gorilla Wood Glue. Well, hey. The desks keep filling up, White Wolf. The desks keep filling up. Master Grade Strike Rouge with Uturi Pack is done. Well, if we ignore applying water slides and having a top coat on it, well, yeah, if we ignore all the stuff that we got to do, the good news is that I like to do that with my projects, too. If I just ignore all the steps I have left, then it's basically done. Nice photo shoot. Loving the collage on this guy. And continuing to just, I really, really dig the base plastic colors on this model. I don't know what it is about them. They remind me a little bit of like uh, a bowl of, of Valentine's candy with some of the shitty colors taken out. Maybe that's what it is? I don't know. It just works for me. That, that maroon and the black and that really, really soft pinkish white is incredibly ple- like, this is pleasing to me in the way that makes me think I should try this color palette on something. I'm not sure what. I like it, though. Yeah. Now it works, Sumatha. Oh, shit. Nice build, White Wolf. Very, very nice build. Here we have from Zombie Brush Studios. Zombie My Little Pony for Halloween. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know dick about My Little Pony. I know, I know. It's like, it's like a whole thing. And, and there's probably at least like four people in chat who are going to be like, it's really actually pretty cool, and it's like mature and for adults. And I don't doubt that it is. It got it got rewritten as part that's part of that whole uh, alternative adult comedy thing that that happened five to ten years ago. Um, but I, I don't I don't I don't think about it. <laughs> That My Little Pony needs streaking grime. I like I like where your head's at, Chin. I like where your head's at. Well, the pony does look dead. I like the washed out eye. The the milky eye. I like how you can still kind of see the eye in there. That's that's a nice touch. And then there it appears that there's a hole in her butt and you can see her brains through it. Uh, I'm not gonna pretend to understand that one entirely. <laughs> uh, yeah, intestines also in the butt. That's where intestines go, right, Mr. J? I'm good at anatomy. I like how there's a little... Is that a sad jack-o'-lantern? I can't quite see its face anywhere, but it looks like it's frowning, and that makes me sad. It should be a happy jack-o'-lantern. Jack-o'-lanterns should always be having fun. Or being evil. One of the two. Cutie mark. <laughs> 
sure. You know what, Zombie Brush? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. The half-eaten part of the face that's under the lock of hair, that's a nice touch. Very nice. Zombie Brush, your, uh, your style is pleasing no matter what it's applied to. Honestly, nicely done. Nicely done. I have two daughters, therefore I must know what MLP is. I'm so sorry, Zombie Brush. <laughs> oh, God. Here we have from Roland. We got that set up Sunday edition shot with the photo box set up. Yes. I cannot recommend photo boxes enough, you guys. I, I really can't. Um, I'm going to say it one more time, and you know what I'm going to say. Taking pictures of minis is as hard or harder than painting them in the first place. Um, don't hamstring yourself. Photo boxes are not terribly expensive, and most of them can be broken down, flat-packed, and then set up over the course of just a few minutes. So, uh, get one. Because holy crap, it makes such a massive difference. A massive difference. I'm glad to see that you got one rolling. So now here's the next trick, Roland. I want you to do these photos again. I'm going to assume you did this on your phone. So I want you to do these photos again. And what I want you to do... Oh, God, Mr. J, that's all too real. I'm not even going to read it. Um, what I want you to do is go to your phone, open up your camera app, go find advanced mode or pro mode, whatever it's called. Find the ISO setting. That is the sensitivity setting for your lens. Frame your image and drop the ISO as low as you can. And what you're going to notice is that the image gets darker, but more specifically, that black background is going to get darker and the contrast is going to get punched up. So lower your sensitivity as low as you can while still being able to see the details of the model and take these photos again. Yeah, sensitivity the sensor. Thank you. Um... But drop that as, like, you probably won't, with one light, you probably won't be able to get as low as, like, 100, 200. But if you can get down to even, like, 800, 600, I think you're going to like what that does to the photos. So give that a shot and try these photos one more time for me. Because uh, I, think, I think you're going to like it. Yeah. I mean... The paint job looks good. I'm just saying, I want to see this guy with the lower sensitivity because it's going to punch up the contrast and I'm going to be, be able to give you more meaningful feedback on it. And, uh, I mean, I, I'm not kidding when I say that taking photos of minis is hard. But, Roland, you're fucking getting there, man. You got the tools at this point. Now, let's tweak them. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Thank you for sharing that cataphragm with us. Oh, here we have from White Wolf again. I was super, super, super tempted to post the Sleeping Eevee here, but I feel like this shot is way too much. I like this shot way too much not to post it. That's what it says. Oof. Excuse me. Master Grade Strike Rouge with Utura Unit. And oh yeah, I'm going to display them with a backpack and jet mode or whatever it's called because it's just too damn lovely not to do this with. This is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. I like this. We've seen a number of your builds at this point, White Wolf, and I have to say, this one uh, consistently is one of the most appealing to me. Sixteen hundred isn't bad, White Wolf. Now, if you've got the right lighting and you've got the right background, 1600 is fine. I think I'm running this camera at ISO 1600 while I paint. Yeah, I was going to say, you're probably dropping your... Yeah, you've got an F5.6. Yeah. This is the thing. It's the balance between ISO, your, your F number, and then your shutter speed. And there's no perfect combination. There's just what works best with your specific lighting setup. Um, 
These days, I drop, when I'm taking photos of my minis, I'm dropping my ISO down to, like, 100. I'm upping my F to, like, 13 to 16 because I like a good depth of field. I'm usually taking a picture of multiple models. And then I'm, I'm making my shutter speed so low that it takes it, like, two to three seconds to take a photo. So I set it up on a tripod that's very secure. And, like, I literally, when I take my photos, I push the button. I have it on a three-second delay timer. I take my hands. I put them on my shoulders, and I stop breathing. <laughs> That's that, this is this is the the anytime you see my photos know that that's what I'm doing to take them so as to not vibrate the camera in any way because with a shutter speed that slow if I wobble my foot on the floor and that shifts the tripod slightly you're going to get a blur in the photo like oof, it's it's touchy photography's hard and I suck at it like bad <laughs> I just know some tricks really nice photography there white wolf here we have from Manro Fasal working on my space marines board game models where I fix while I fix my resin printer one day I might actually finish one paint job before moving on <laughs> that's a, oh Manro that's why I like you man you're funny you got you got good jokes well these are coming together nicely aren't they this was for the um what was this set called I remember when this came out Uh, this wasn't the one that was in, like, booster packs, was it? I saw somebody else who did this set of minis. It was relatively recent, I feel like. I'm loving, by the way, this intense, like, toxic green for the salamander. That's, that's neat. Space Marines Assault, thank you. This this reminds me of being alive in the late 90s, early 2000s, and maybe it's just that it tickles my nostalgia. But I am I'm loving this this vivid sort of toxic yellow green. That's that's wonderful. Um, I realize you're probably going to do more work on this, but please keep some of that because I really really like it. Same for this really vibrant yellow that we have down here for the Imperial Fist. Lovely work, lovely work. Very nicely done, man, bro. Can't wait to see those finished up. Here we have from Zombie Bro Studios 65-inch Thunderhead. Just found out Vizio has a Twitch app. Oh my god, I'm basically on the big screen, you guys. Look at me, look at me. Look at me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a movie star. Oh, this is all I ever wanted. Well, that's it. That's it, guys. Stream over. We're done, we did it. We made it to television. I can I can die now. I mean I'm I'm probably I'll probably keep living. Uh, just you know uh, cover my bases. I'll probably keep living. I'll probably keep streaming. Uh, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. We gotta pay attention to those goals. Here we have from uh, oh oh shit. Thank you for the follow, Captain Brian Blood. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers, my friend. Here we have from Vergadering. Played a game with my friend on Friday. Wait, you mean we can play games with these minis? That's, that's that's silly. It was fun, but we didn't get to finish since he wanted to do 15,000 battle value. The Com Guard took heavy fire early because I misunderstood the line of sight rules, which amount to elevation ignores nearly everything. Yes, that is true. Elevation ignores pretty much everything. Uh, I got some good hits in, and ECM sensor ghosts are gross. I got assaults up to plus five defense mod twice. Yikes! Ooh, but the board is looking nice. We're not we're not quite finished with the alien terrain. We got some river painting to do here to match it all up with this test piece that he's got here in the center. But oh man, is it ever coming together? Look at this. We got forests of of alien plants. We've got crystal forests glowing in grow. Growing in close to the Sulphur River. We got some of these here desert style hills. We've got a drop ship back here. We have some of the Hextech uh, fluid works built over here. This is a good looking board. Vergaderung. I really, I know I've said it before, but I cannot fucking wait to see this board completed. Your test pieces for this, that being the Sulphur River section here and the hill section here is just, it's so nice. It's so nice. 
Ooh. You gotta get right up against the terrain for the cover to work against LOS. Yes, it's, 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 you gotta deal with the abstractions. Um, there are some house rules that I've come up with to mitigate some of what you're talking about, Vergata Run, but, you know, house rules being what they are, not everybody wants to use them. Lovely. Lovely looking board. And with some fantastic minis on it, Vergata Run, well fucking done, my friend. So close. So damn close. Here we have from Avash. Looks like we're playing some Conquest. Oh, yeah. Avash... I'm gonna get I'm gonna get you some 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 snazzier looking terrain. I'm gonna get you some snazzier looking terrain, my man. The paint jobs are looking nice. That orange that you picked really pops out even at average viewing distance. I'm loving that. Oh my god, look at this. What Oh, I just realized where the battle lines were and where we were fighting. I'm like, why is he behind the Oh no, these are the Nords here. And then we have our battle line for the Hundred Kingdoms here. Our cavalry is all the way back here, and these poor men at arms are facing off against an Ice Jotnar. That's... Ah... <laughs> I feel so bad for them. This model's fucking huge! <laughs> is what you have in the store. We're gonna... You know what, Avash? We're gonna get you some more terrain in that store if I have to donate it myself. I'm telling you. Haunter, um, I stream Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Till whenever. <laughs> it's usually, uh, usually about a four to five hour stream. Hundred Kingdoms is such a cool faction to me, but I'm not sure if anyone near me plays Conquest. Captain Brian Blood, I feel for you on that one, man. It's it's always it's always difficult to evangelize a new game system. And I'll be the first to admit that in many cases it can wind up not being worth it in your local area because even if you succeed in creating a, a gaming core in your local area, people who play the game, it might not expand past that and it'll, it'll peter out in a while. Now, Conquest is doing really, really well as far as gaining traction and gaining momentum in the wargaming community in general. So I would say that Conquest is one of the games that is worth evangelizing to your local players and worth building a group if you're willing to do that. Um, building a local gaming group is hard work. I've, I've done it a number of times. So, you know, if you don't feel like doing that, don't, don't feel bad. It is work. I would say that I, I think it's worth it. It's, it's, it is a, a fantastic game. Avash, I would genuinely be interested in doing that. Um, ping me on Discord, and let's talk, because I'm, I've am i got a number of pieces of Conquest-specific terrain that I have already built, and I have a few pieces that are in the works. And in all honesty, I need more feedback on it. I'm going to be releasing it, but I, I need people to not just print it and play it and go, this is good, but print it and play it and say, this could be better, this worked, this didn't, this didn't, I'd like to see this. So if you're willing to do that for me, I would be very willing to help provide you guys with some terrain and make these conquest boards look just, just a little bit snazzier and still work well for you, man. Hey, Darkheart, it's good to see you, man. Thank you so, so much for that resub, my friend. Let's come down here and see what we got from Scud24. They gather in plots. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh, dear God. Are these tree crabs? What kind of little crabos are these? Look at them. They're ridiculous. If only one of them was holding a cigarette. I know. I know it's just a meme, but the crab holding the cigarette is just one of my favorite things. Murderous dark-shelled crabs. Yeah, they're sneaky, aren't they? Wouldn't even see them if you were just walking by them. Sneaky, sneaky tree crabs. I don't trust them. I don't trust them one bit. Here we have from Sumatha. Operation Lancaster Thunderhead Studio exclusive previews, plural. 
you just lack a Thursday stream. Fair enough. In this case, some sketches by Plog. The finals are coming soon, but for now, I figure you guys and gals might enjoy seeing these. <gasps> First up, we have the Legacy Assault Battle Mech, known simply as Isorla, as it was taken by a former clan mech warrior following the action of Operation Lancaster. However, per our very own Ion Raptor's recommendation, as this version of the Legacy is his creation, it was known as Whitehead during the fighting on Ashkum 4 that took place during Lancaster. This particular legacy was enhanced with clan technology by the word of Blake and custom fitted to suit its pilot. While the Dreadnought Battle Corps further enhanced the machine after it was capped relatively intact, had needed replacing. <laughs> it was already a terrifying piece of equipment, with its main guns being twin clan ER PPCs enhanced with Blake has developed experimental PPC capacitors. Wait, an inner sphere mech enhanced with clan tech by the word of Blake? Fucking everybody has their hand in this thing. Now, we've seen other versions of this guy before. And I continue to love how it just has, like... It has this, this sort of pleasing chevron shape to its torso. And then, like, a couple of tank turrets, like, just stapled onto its shoulders. It, it works bizarrely well. A dark Heart, I, you know, I didn't actually have that much feedback on the Banshee. Besides, I like the little splashes of yellow. And I, I wonder what it's going to look like in a big group of similarly painted ones. I, I love the, the warm colors you included on the face. All in all, though, mostly just the thumbs up on that one, dude. Really well done. Oh. I like Plog's rough art. It, it gives me some idea of, of how he gets where he's going, you know? I like these capacitors on here, too. As far as just little design elements go, that really, that, that works for me. Pieces where I can see it and, and and tell what it's meant to be and what it's meant to do. Little nasty grabby claws, too. Oh, graspy hands. Reminds me of, uh, like, Shin Godzilla with his horrible little curled up useless hands. I think these hands are arguably more useful than that, but uh, still. Pew Pew, indeed. The second of tonight's special sketch previews. Well, again, drawn by Matt Plog, comes from our own Cyber Knight, a.k.a. Magnatorious Maximus, a joke that just won't die. You've seen the miniature now, you'll see how the attitude of the machine has been captured, and man, has it ever been captured. The pose seems almost like someone shot a small laser at it, and it turned around and slowly and dramatically said, Motherfucker, you out of your damn mind? I'm sorry, I had to channel Blade there for a moment. Once a centuries-old BL-7KNT, this particular Black Knight known as Carver was modified for use on Solaris 7 by one of two siblings. When the sister in question was killed in the arena, the mech was received by the brother. Seeing as how it's now a Dreadnought Battle Corps machine, it received considerable TLC and lots of upgrades. The final resulting machine is a brutal monster that combines some of the best weapons and armor technology the Dreadnought has to offer, wrapped around the same triple-strength Myomer musculature and nasty hatchet that it was given on Solaris 7, and all that is wrapped around a restored original standard chassis and the factory original VLAR 300 standard fusion engine. Truly, this has become a generational machine, and it has made all the more durable for it. With a combination of powerful energy weapons and a lethal hatchet, Carver is truly terrifying at any range. Only more so, the closer it gets. I mean, yeah, I, we know we love this one. We know we love this one, because we've seen Carver before. I still love the way that its hatchet is built. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he definitely has that energy to the turnaround was just like, what the fuck did you just say to me? <laughs> this is, this is a troublesome look. Just lovely. I, 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 I know that you guys know I love Matt Plog's artwork, but, um, I think most surprisingly, I like I never get tired of Matt Plog's artwork. A lot of artists out there, I'll eventually get tired of their style and I'll move on to something else, but Plog is uh something he does speaks to me. Something he does speaks to me. I cannot wait to see the final versions of these particular pieces. Actually enhance the hatchet a bit. Needs a 2.0 for the hatchet. Oh, did he? I recognize the funny little slide weight on it, certainly. And then these nasty little, like, chopping teeth. It is one of my favorite hatchet designs. And I like his little crest. It's adorable. It looks like Quail Man. Lovely. And thank you for sharing, Sumatha. 
Here we have from Pun Expected. Here is the pinup Nicholas Cage in Wicker. <coughs> I mean the KDM Honeycomb Weaver pinup I worked on with Steela Rebel on Friday. Nearly done. Can we just can we just never never ever mention the Nicholas Cage Wicker Man again? Can it pains me. It pains me because I really quite like the original Wicker Man with Christopher Lee. It is it is, it is a personal favorite movie of mine. And anytime I mention in any conversation, I'm like, I really like the Wicker Man. Everyone's like, oh, Nicholas Cage. No. 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 <laughs> Damn that fucking movie. <sighs> that said. That's some, that's some honey you got there. What's what's going on here? What what is this? I find this concerning. I I need to know what this is. I mean, I know that Kingdom Death minis are are weird. Maybe I don't understand quite how weird. <laughs> I really like the richness of the color that you got for the honey. This is this is this lovely kind of red amber color. It works surprisingly well. It's a grub of some kind, not as okay, I wasn't entirely sure where this this was going. Yes, it's some kind of grub. The grub ass. For those of you who might not be aware, for those of you who might who might, who might be in the stream and not know, uh, Kingdom Death has some very strange and very uh, suggestive miniatures in their line. Uh, this is far from the most suggestive of the models you're going to find in that line. I love the choice of the hair color, by the way. This particular green-blue is a lovely balance to that amber. Oh my god, PSK Studio. Oh my god. Oh. I always, I always feel a little bit bad when people raid towards the end of the stream. I do. I do. PSK, welcome in. Thank you so, so much for the raid. I hope that you had a great stream. I'm curious what you were working on. Welcome in, everyone. Thank you for bringing your viewers in. We are uh, relatively close to the end of tonight's stream, and 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 for that, I I do apologize. But we're just going over our art share segment that we do at the end of every stream. Sir Jacob, thank you so so much for the follow, my friend. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. PSK, how you doing tonight, man? How was your stream? What were you working on? I'm curious. And thank you. Thank you very much for the raid. Thanks for bringing your people in there. We're looking at a, a Kingdom Death mini that Pun Expected has been working on. I'm definitely not just staring at voluptuous anime miniature butts. No, I'm admiring the striping on the bees, damn it. Because it's it's fine. It's fine striping. Really, though. Um, pun Expected. The, this amber color you got on the honey, I'm a little curious what recipe you used. Because that's, like, really nice. Like, really, really quite nice. TC Gentry, Crypty Minis. Thank you each for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. What do we have up next? Here we have from Sam Mini, a little advance on CP new skin from Ouroboros. Oh, no. Oh, my, my, my. Welcome is this everyone. just how it's going to be? To Thunderhead Studios, where the only rule is... <laughs> Please don't show me your genitals. Please don't. Have fun, be safe, and above all... Don't show them to me. Don't do For the it. love of God. Don't do it. It's, it's, it's not worth it. <laughs> Take it all off. Peel the skin. Show me, show me your robot parts. I want to see your input port, lady. Look at that hair. That's just... That's where I'm lost right now is in the hair. That blue to pink. And this is something I talk about when I try to do hair. It has that sheen to it, that shine that is just so difficult to get. Ooh. That is so effective. Look at the little bit of look at the, the little bit of warmth. So we have mostly cool metallic colors here, but look at this little bit of warmth that there is between the, 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 the transition where the skin is being peeled off. It's it's the light being reflected off of the skin and onto the metal. <sighs> I 
Is this how it's gonna be, Sam Mini? Is this is just is this just the new fucking normal? Because if it is, like I, I'm okay with it, but it's gonna be a whole lot of me going, God damn it! <laughs> I'm really proud of this mini. I did a good job. Oh look, Sam Mini. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god this is lovely thank you for doing that shout out by the way data nerd uh, Sam Mini paints right here on Twitch guys so uh, please go give him a follow he's an amazing painter absolutely amazing these are the kind of paint jobs that, that, that I stare at to try to learn from this is the texture on it, the texture on the the not just the 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 skin that's that's loose, but the taut skin, the skin that's being pulled off, the texture on it is so effective. You can you can tell it has that motion to it. You know, this is fantastic. This is ah <sighs> uh, yeah. Love how the purple tone from the hair is carried to the lower parts of the body. Yeah, uh, this is something that um, Wapelius always says that I try to take to heart. PSK, absolutely, man. You never have to apologize for raiding and running, man. You have been streaming. You have a life to live. You have other shit to do. PSK, thank you so much for the raid, man. Thanks for bringing your people in. I hope you had a fantastic stream, and I hope to catch your next one, man. You have a great night. Um, but something that Wapelius always says, if a color goes anywhere, it must go everywhere. And he's not wrong. Well, that's what you're saying. We've got this... this is, it's color composition. And yeah, some of our color from up here is reflected in the lower body. And it's just... It's not a direct reflection. It's not meant to imply that, you know, the hair is reflecting down there. It's just that that visual symmetry is, is very, very pleasing to the eye and to the mind. I gotta move on. I gotta move on, Sam Mini. I, oh, fuck, there's another picture. Ah, shit! <sighs> Look at the skin tones. Look at the skin tones. Look at the, 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 the magentas in the shadow on the face, moving down into what looks like we have a metallic lower lip. <sighs> I'm working so hard right now. So hard right now inside my own mind to take the best lessons from this. and not to think about how much work I have ahead of me. <laughs> to look forward to the work that I have ahead of me and my desire to achieve painting results like this. Silver linings. Silver linings, folks. This is... Uh, look at the greens in the metallic. <sighs> Sam Mini, you are a truly phenomenal painter, and I know that I kid a lot, I know that I that I joke around, but I have a serious admiration for your work. I love seeing what you're working on, and I, I sincerely hope each and every time that you continue to share with us, man. Thank you so much. Really, honestly, Sam Mini, thank you for sharing your work with us today. I I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I know. I I, I know some of it. I know. Hey, we have from Scud24. The crab has found a bountiful harvest. Oh, he's eating he's eating like tree moss. Oh, it's kind of cute. Look at him. He's gonna munch. He's gonna munch on the lichen. Hmm. Where are the... what? I, I, I've never lived anywhere with tree crabs like this. Huh. I guess maybe we had tree crabs in Florida and I just never saw them. They, they were dark and nobody ever told me about them. I guess I wouldn't have. Huh. Either way. That is a kind of a cool photo. He's, he's getting ready to settle in for a nice big feast. Here we have from Roland another photo of a Cyclops this time. Is that a Cyclops? That's a Cyclops, isn't it? Why can't I tell? Why is the shape of the head eluding me so much? Yeah, that's a Cyclops. Yeah, because he's got the, the, the thing. The what's-its. The dealie. Stick it off his back for whatever damn reason. Again, um, if I've taken anything away from your photos today, Roland, it's that your uh, brushwork has shown the most improvement of anything that I've seen that you're working on. Your paints go down in nice, clean layers now. 
and you're you're not getting a lot of slop. All your colors are going right where you intend them to go, and man, that is progress. I, I'm going to say the same thing I said before, though. I want you to start pushing that contrast just as much as you can, because I think that's your next step, man. I think that that is your next step as a painter that is going to push you over the edge into another... O over the threshold, into the next, the next category, the next order of magnitude of painting. Lovely work, Roland. Also, I want a cup of coffee right now. I'm so suggestible. It's disgusting. Here we have our Achilles Rain. Ooh. A tiny photo. Achilles, would you do me a favor next time and just crop your photo a little bit so that we can get a little bit closer? Because if I blow this photo up, I can get a nice close view of it and see all the details. That nice sort of ashen blue color to the skin sort of contrasted with that much more vivid, almost cobalt blue we have in the hair. I actually really like that quite a lot. The green on the edge of the cloak is very nice. What is this one for? The little splash of yellow metallic on the belt details is, is excellent. I like how it's echoed on the details on the blade and then on the scabbard for the blade. This isn't a war... No, that's not a War Machine model, is it? I don't think I would recognize that. The cloak looks strangely familiar, though. But yeah, um, for pictures like this in the future, Achilles, if all you do is just go in and crop it to right here, that will just make it... And this this is this is my fault, honestly. This is my weakness because we do the Storm Report directly in Discord. Um, it, it, just, it just makes it difficult for me to show it on screen because I can't make the photo any larger while staying in the Discord window. This is, okay, yeah, this is from War Machine. Because I was looking at it thinking, like, this reminds me of, like, one of the Legion of Everblight models that I painted. The style of the cloak. So I guess I'm not entirely crazy. Nice clean paint job, though. I, I really like the skin tone, I have to say. Achilles, I really, really like the skin tone. Good work on that. Here we have from White Wolf. This just in. Literally, this is taken as of five minutes before the storm report closes as the sleeping EV watches and guards the excess runner bits. Progress on the Master Grade Sazabi version ka begins. He's already a big boy and will only be getting bigger. One of the biggest, baddest, reddest mobile suits out there. This is a kid I'm definitely looking forward to building up. Doubly so, because hubby surprised me with it all. Oh. Also, yes, I removed the seam lines in the sleeping EV, even if it's a quick kit. I want it to look good. But hey, those seam lines were kind of bugging me anyway. I use my weathering pencils and oil brushers anyway, so why not? Why not, indeed? Anything worth doing is worth over... Oh, he's kind of cute. This is genuinely kind of cute. This is a big build, isn't it? This will be interesting. I'm really liking the plastic colors on it, too. You sleep, Evie. You sleep. Because everyone's going to want to shove, like, leaf stones and water stones and everything up your ass and turn you into all sorts of weird fucking mutants. That's your lot in life, you poor little fox Pokemon. <sighs> the world is a dark and twisted place. Here we have, from Zombie Brush Studios, some bullshit. Evil Rick Astley be like, I will let you down. I will make you hurt Yeah, <laughs> It's not... Let's look... Trent isn't evil. Trent is emo. <laughs> He's the very definition of it. Come on. <laughs> oh. Oh, that just made me think of that amazing skit that they did on The Whitest Kids You Know. We recently lost um, Trevor from The Whitest Kids You Know. He, he passed. I don't know if everyone out there is familiar with the comedy group, The Whitest Kids You Know. If you are not, you should look them up. They are funny as hell. They were funny as hell. One of their major... Well, the, like, one of their front men um, passed fairly recently. And uh, it sucks. It, it really sucks, because he was, he was a really funny guy, and he was not particularly old. It's very, very tragic. But I think of that because he does a wonderful Trent Reznor skit that is... Um, well, if you've ever if you've ever really listened to a lot of Trent's work, it will it will speak to you. It's it's fantastic. 
Sir Jacob, I like you. <laughs> You know exactly what I'm talking about. Merlin models trying to give the base for this a bit of a storyline. It's very hard to pose this Chaos Space Marine limp, using green stuff to fill the gaps, rending the armor open, and repainting the corpse on the base. Never done it. Never done pinning before, and I have very little green stuff experience. Always worth expanding my abilities. Um, I'll give you one tip for green stuff, and you may already know it. Water. Whatever tool you're using to smooth your green stuff when you're trying to just smooth out tool markings in it, dip the tool in water. Also, I strongly recommend getting yourself a small set of what are called silicone color shapers. I believe that they're meant for... I'm not really sure what color shapers are meant to do. Like what they're designed for. But they're soft silicone implements with a series of different shaped tips. And they're fantastic for green stuff sculpting. And, and any tool that you're using with green stuff, if you're looking to smooth or just not to pull on it, just a touch of water will absolutely do it. And then, you know, let it dry before you continue working on it. Either way, I'm digging the base for this armature. Have you considered... I'm just saying, I'm just saying that the armature has on its arm a gigantic double chainsaw. Right? So I'm just saying... What if the Chaos Space Marine was sawn in half? Not just... not just rent open. Oh, you could do rent open. That could look cool. But what if he was sawn in half? And then you could use green stuff to make, like, little ropes of intestine connecting the bottom half of him to the top half of him? Huh? Huh? It's just a thought. It's just a thought. It could be cool. It's for clay? Okay, I mean, that, that makes sense. That's that's basically exactly what I use them for. Fair enough. <clears throat> yes. Yes, indeed. Either way, lovely work, Merlin, and I look forward to seeing that one come along. And yeah, uh, always worth expanding your abilities. That's why I say try everything. Try everything. Um, you won't like everything. Everything won't work for you, but try everything. Know how to use all the tools. Put all the tools in your box. Know how to work them. Know what they're for. And that way, when you come up against a hobbying task, you've got you can you can reach in and pull out the tools that you need. You know, keep what works. Leave what doesn't. And speaking of leaving, that unfortunately brings us to the end of the storm report, and thus to the end of tonight's stream. But not before Dave's mini art comes in with that resub. Dave, how are you doing, man? It's good to see you. Ah, but let's transition real quick, what do you say? Absolutely, Merlin Models. I, I hope that that's helpful. Um, I, I, I always try to give helpful advice. I don't know how often I really do it, but... Uh, I, feel like, I feel like a lot of what I say is really fucking obvious, but sometimes we need to hear the obvious things. Sometimes we need to hear those things. I'm doing pretty fantastic, Dave, and thank you so much for asking. Oh, uh, we are just about at the end of tonight's stream. Let me see what is going on elsewhere in the Twitch-verse real quick. Who is doing what? Hmm. Me. No, don't. Don't. Stop playing my audio back at me. Uh, well, Pelius is going. Megapedia is going. Hootie's playing some Until Dawn. Teal Sakiri is rocking October. Bong Barian is playing some Project Zomboid. Late Night Painter is working on some Warhammer. Wombat Combat Prime is... What is he doing? What is? What are you doing, Wombat Combat? Let me look. He literally just started. It says Lychee Slicer Halloween Slicing. Is he slicing files for 3D printing? Hmm. I'm not sure. Let me see what Teal Security's up to. Teal Security just got started, and he's about to lay into this big old orc with some oil paints. And that's where we're going. That's where we're going. Now, folks, I know a lot of you are probably going to turn in. It is a little late at night. But I don't just throw raids around willy-nilly. I always try to make my raids worthwhile as far as content that you probably want to see if you've enjoyed yourself in this stream. So if you've stuck around for this long and you feel like doing me a favor, stick around for just a couple of minutes. Go with the raid. Check out Teal Sakiri's channel. 
See if you like what he's doing. Consider dropping him a follow because he is a uh, a truly fantastic streamer and a good friend. Good friend at this point. We've been uh, we've been kind of going back and forth for a while now. <sighs> Folks, tonight's been a good night. Um, I had a rough week. I, I had a rough week. There was just some bullshit for me this week, and uh, kind of got my my feet knocked out from under me. Lost a bit of my hobbying momentum. So this weekend was me kind of trying to bring it back together and, and and get moving forward on some projects. Um, got to get got to get the rest of this conquest force built. But I am so close to the end. I, I'm I'm within one unit of being done. So guys, thank you for hanging out with me tonight. And getting some of this building done. Thank you to all the followers. A huge thank you to to for for the raid. Oh my god, you guys are absolutely fucking amazing. A, a massive thank you as always to everyone who contributed to the storm report. I always love seeing your work. And also, as always, my amazing mod team, without whom none of this would be possible. We'll be back on Tuesday doing some conquest. I should have said all these things faster. I'm about to run out of time. We're going to be doing the Supercell on Thursday. You can find out more information on the Discord, and we'll be back Sunday. Oh my god, the stream's about to end. I'll see you later. Uh, keep on painting.